So, uh, good morning, colleagues. Uh, my name is Nav Chohan. Um, I'm principal of Shipley College. Um, I am going to make small talk for 60 seconds just to give people an opportunity to log on. I'm surrounded here by various pieces of electronic equipment that I trust are all working in perfect harmony to try and give you a smooth experience this morning. I also have a few pieces of paper for those of you who are a little bit old school, just to, for a little bit of comfort. And clearly I'm coming to terms with talking into this screen. Um, normally uh, I would smell and hear you, um, but um, uh, the positive is I can't hear any heckling from the back. So let's, let's look for that silver lining. Um, right then, I think we're, we're coming up to 9.31, so let's get going. Um, as chair of the Lead City Region Skills Network, I'd like to uh, warmly welcome you uh, to our annual conference. This is our 11th annual conference. And uh, interestingly enough, it will be our last. Um, more on that later. Uh, we have uh, more than 300 people signed up from across the region's education and skills sector, um, with people from independent training providers, universities, and FE colleges, uh, alongside the councils. And within that, there's the individual councils, but also the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Um, also, a warm welcome to our employers that are joining us, though today is more about uh, the skills system itself. Um, first up, I have to say thank you very much to our sponsors. <laughs> this is sponsored by um, European Social Fund, ESIF funds, under the Let's Talk Real Skills project. Oh, I've been told I must mention that, so I'll, I'll get that in early. Um, I really hope you enjoy the day uh, as we bring you presentations from some of the key figures across the skills system in West Yorkshire, and of course from our newly elected Mayor, Tracy Brabin. Um, some housekeeping to begin with. Um, toilets and food are your own affair, uh, luckily enough, um, but this online system has been decide, designed to be as easy as possible for you. Um, up that way, I think, um, is the watch live button. If you get lost on any of the system, uh, any of the other menus, um, and you want to get back to the main conference, just come back to that watch live button. Um, next to that is also a networking tab. If you click on that, you'll be able to see all the list of uh, the other people that are attending. Clicking on that individual, you can uh, click on send connection request and make those connections that you normally would um, in an online, uh, but in a real time conference. Um, and down below, I think that way, uh, that way, um, is a live discussion uh, link. Uh, if you click on that, uh, you'll see three options. One is for a chat. Now, beware conference, that chat is to everybody. Um, so mind your P's and Q's. I know you're polite people anyway, but um, uh, just be aware that everyone will be seeing that. Um, and the next option is a QA. and a uh, You can ask questions of all our speakers. And at the end of each group of presentations, we'll be having a Q&A session where you can put forward um, some, some of your own ideas and someone will be curating those and uh, making sure we don't get too much repetition. There's also some polls, an option for polls in there, but we won't be using those today. Um, but we are doing some polls up above, um, something to do with uh, pajamas, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure uh, what that is. So um, why do we come together as a skills network? Uh, and why do we go out of our way to hold this annual skills network conference? Um, I'd like to say it's because we like each other so much, but um, uh, maybe that's not strictly true. Um, and indeed, we are uh, competitors in many cases, uh, whether that's com competitors for students, individuals, or relationships with employers. Um, and indeed, this uh, I, I get the sense that this level of collaboration doesn't exist uh, across the rest of the country um, as far as I'm aware. Um, the Skills Network is a formal meeting. We have representation from universities, FE providers, independent training providers, and the West Yorkshire Combined Authority also attend. Um, I've got to say that during the first lockdown, um, we did we 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 stopped working so much. I think everybody was concentrating on their own institutions um, for obvious reasons um, and there wasn't much space for that collaborative work. But during the second lockdown it became 
clear that we needed a way of talking to local uh, government and local politicians. Um, and in parallel, devolution was happening. Um, and the very fact of devolution means that local politicians and policy officers can affect what and how we do things. So the key bit for us then is rather than being a passive recipient of those things, how can we engage at a senior level so that we can take part in designing our skills landscape in a way that just wasn't possible when everything was run from Whitehall. Um, as such, we're changing the name of the organisation to reflect the local politics a little more, um, and we're going to become the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership. Um, so uh, today we're beginning, and hence this is why this is the last Leeds City Region um, Skills Partnership uh, Skills Network Conference, um, and we're going to become the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership. If I call us the Skills Network for the rest of the day, then apologies, I just can't keep up with the new language. Um, so uh, the importance of skills is probably is front and centre now. Um, for the first time, we were the main item in a Queen's speech. Um, and there's an associated white paper going through Parliament. And perhaps as a region, we can't have too much effect on that. But in parallel, we have uh, an economic recovery plan that was produced by the West Yorkshire Combined Authority. Um, and skills is one of its three areas of main focus. Um, <laughs> this is our time in the sun. Um, there's a lot of publicity about the lack of skills. I think this week, HGV drivers were writ large. Um, similarly, uh, everything else, from skilled craftsmen to um, uh, digital sector skills are seen as lacking. Um, and, and I think we have to do a bit of reflection on why the system isn't perfect anyway. We do all this collaboration. We've been working for ages trying to join up employers with the supply of skilled employees. Why, why can't we get it right? Um, and, and I think there's a host of cultural, systemic, financial issues that get in the way of us doing as well as we could. Um, in, a, in amongst that, we have upheavals in what we deliver and how we deliver it almost every other year. Um, and as a skills network, what we're trying to do is come up with those conversations where we can affect the environment within which we work um, and devolution is our uh, opportunity I think that if we can make a sustained decent uh, case that we may be able to get the resources that will make um, West Yorkshire that much of a better place to work in. The, the newly awarded Sir Roger Marsh is going to talk today and quite often he mentions um, the idea of West Yorkshire becoming a net contributor, net contributor to the public purse. Um, and to do that, our uh, population has to become more produ productive and skills are a major plank towards ensuring that we can become that productive. Um, today, uh, Wicker and the LEP are announcing the new Employment and Skills Framework, which was developed in the Employment Skills Panel, um, chaired by uh, Rashid Palmer, who is also speaking today. Um, and in his forward to the new Employment and Skills Framework, he, he offers this quote. We want West Yorkshire to be a world leading region where investment in skills, training and education and support from employers go hand in hand to create a diverse, inclusive and highly skilled workforce with good jobs, leading to sustained improvements in the quality of life for all. So some key points in there. Um, diverse quality of life for all um, so conference if you could sort that out by next Tuesday uh, I'd greatly appreciate it um, as we emerge from lockdown we have to think about what kind of skills environment we want to work in and so I'll, I'll leave you with one question uh, devolution will give us more flexibility as a region but what will we as a skills system want to do with that flexibility. So if you could think about that, colleagues, comments greatly appreciated. So welcome to a new name. Uh, the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership wants to be at the centre of conversation and actions that will make Rashid's vision some kind of reality. 
And now let's get going with that conference. I'm so pleased to be here as the first ever West Yorkshire Mayor to talk to you all at the launch of the Skills Network Conference. Ensuring that everyone in West Yorkshire has the skills they need to secure good work and the ability to enjoy opportunities of our region is at the heart of why I stood as your Mayor. I know firsthand the transformational impact that skills and education have to change people's lives. I grew up in a council flat in Bristol on free school meals and like so many of my generation, I was the first in my family to go to university. I studied drama at Loughborough and then went back to education later in life to complete an MA in screenwriting. Not only did this increase my earning potential, but it meant that I didn't have to go on tour and I could stay at home with my two young daughters. Growing up, Many of the opportunities in my life came from local governments providing secure housing, great libraries and good free education. But going back to the estate where I grew up and where my mum still lives, I don't think that the same advantages exist today for those young people and I'm concerned about the impact this will have on their life chances. Unless we can do something radical, radical to Unless we can do something to radically change this, we risk an entire generation falling further behind. That's why I'm so pleased to be here to launch the new West Yorkshire Employment and Skills Framework, which will help us meet our ambitions to improve skills and opportunities for everyone in the region. I want West Yorkshire to be the go-to place for world-class skills and training with a talented workforce who have a good quality of life and where no one is left behind. As we look to the long recovery from the pandemic and the effects of historic underinvestment in our towns, cities and villages, it's clear we need to become a higher skilled and more productive workforce with good jobs accessible for all. Sadly, even before the pandemic, over 270,000 people across West Yorkshire were not in good work in terms of high quality, secure, well paid employment. And what's more, about 380,000 people in West Yorkshire have low or no qualifications. And we know, don't we, that low skills all too often go hand in hand with disadvantage the health, social and environmental challenges that we need to overcome to give everyone the best quality of life. And this is most acute for our poorest children, those on free school meals and living in poverty, who can suffer the most without skills and qualifications of their peers. And that's why in my manifesto, I promise to create 1000 well paid skilled jobs for young people and to ensure that the relevant green courses are available and accessible. Not only will these courses ensure young people have relevant skills and training to progress in their careers, but they will also contribute to the skilled workforce needed to meet our ambitious target of net zero carbon emissions by 2038. As well as the growth of the green economy, demand for digital specialist workers with high level skills continues to be robust with acute shortages. And with this in mind, I'm committed to delivering a digital academy supported by businesses and skills providers to ensure our young people have the skills required to be the entrepreneurs, the innovators, engineers and creatives of the future. We must also help the adults who lack a polished CV or who haven't had a career path up the career ladder. It can be so hard to get the skills needed later in life, and I'm determined we tackle that as a matter of urgency for all ages and all backgrounds. Opportunities to upskill and retrain not only offer hope to those facing challenges as a result of the changing economy, but also to those who may be balancing work with caring responsibilities or managing a disability or need part time work. That's why, as mayor, I've pledged to prioritise skills and training for people of all ages and to support good local businesses with the skills they need to thrive as our region recovers. This also means 
increasing the number of businesses paying the real living wage and to help lift 200,000 people in our region out of low pay. As a first step, we recently invested £13.5 million into our employment hub and reboot adult skills training provision to enhance and expand support for people looking to build new skills, access training or to find work. And the new £65 million adult education budget will enable us to more closely align spending on skills to the opportunities and needs here in West Yorkshire. All of this will enable us to build an economy that's able to make the most of new opportunities created in the digital and green economy and crucially to raise living standards and not force a race to the bottom on pay. So thank you so much for having me here to speak today. Over the rest of this morning, you'll find out more about how the skills framework will help to transform the way we deliver skills training across our brilliant region. You'll also hear about the transformative benefits of the education and training we're putting in place to help people find new jobs and also to build the skills they need for the kind of roles that will be in demand as the economy recovers. Your efforts through the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership are absolutely crucial and I want to thank you personally for all the continued work you're doing supporting everyone in our region to get the skills and training they need to get on. I know that by working together, we can truly realise the enormous potential of our region. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Roger Marsh. As a number of you know, I'm not only chair of the Leeds City Region and Enterprise Partnership, uh, as well as the uh, NP11 across the wider north and a member of the combined authority here in West Yorkshire. And I'm delighted yet again to be able to speak to you, although by video, although I probably will be in person on the day. Um, skills for West Yorkshire is the theme of this conference, and I want to talk to you about why it's important, even more so as a result of the pandemic. Skilled people, good jobs and strong businesses are exactly what the region needs to th uh, thrive. If you didn't know already, West Yorkshire is the largest labour market in the Northern Powerhouse, with strengths in manufacturing, financial professional services, and the rapidly developing fields of digital and healthcare technology. Our diversity, uh, rich cultural heritage and geography makes West Yorkshire one of the country's best places to live, study and work. As you'll hear more of during the day, uh, reflected in the employment and skills framework's priority to create a culture investment in workforce skills, and it's never been more important to invest in skills and training. The pandemic has thrown up sharp relief and, and major structural transformations taking place in our economy, some of which have happened almost overnight. And we need to turbocharge the process so that whole industries and sectors that have been changed uh, in such a short time are able to take advantage of the new opportunities. As we know, the pandemic has highlighted the inequalities amongst our workforce and those uh, uh, who have been hardest hit are in the most disadvantaged in the labour market. So without targeted and uh, very focused help with upskilling and retraining in sectors where there is current and future demand, we risk damaging life chances of a whole generation and something that I personally uh, am not, not prepared to uh, countenance. Low investment in training and development makes it hard for many people to find a route out of low pay, low skilled employment. It also means many businesses are less innovative and thereby less productive than, than those elsewhere in the UK. And if I could just take a pause in history, remind you of the words of the late John F. Kennedy. Uh, and he said, change is the law of life. And those who want <clears throat> look only to the past and the present are certain to miss the future. Well, we, we're not going to miss the future. Investing in skills is also essential for that prosperity of our of our region's businesses and economy high level skills as i've said drive innovation and productivity but we've seen that widening gap uh, and we need to do something to address that and take advantage uh, of, uh, of of the circumstances and the opportunities too, too few employers see the value in workforce skills plans to support diversity growth and we need to support the development of leadership and management skills across our businesses to support such skills utilisation in the workplace at all levels. 
We also need to start building the skills for the economy of tomorrow, in the words of John F. Kennedy. We know that we will need workers with specific and technical skills <coughs> to deliver our transition to net zero carbon economy by 2038, particularly in construction areas of domestic ref uh, retrofitting and in the energy sector, which is susceptible to shortages in professional roles such as engineers and skilled trades. Promoting decarbonisation and sustainability within the economy has skills implications and opportunities across a wide range of sectors, manufacturing, passenger transport, freight, automotive and financial services. So businesses across the whole economy will need to upskill their workforce in broader resource efficiency and carbon literacy. The rewards of investing in skills speak for themselves. West Yorkshire's productivity gap lags that behind the, the whole UK. Closing that gap is equivalent to adding 10% of our pre-pandemic economy. That is a, a sizable prize worth fighting for. As we know, the UK is one of the most unequal and centralised countries in the developed world. The government's levelling up agenda must empower local areas to tackle long-standing inequalities by addressing the lack of investment and powers that has for too long held back parts of the UK. It, what it mustn't be is an unhealthy competition between places and functional economic areas, but a national, and I characterise it, Chinese map, sorry, not Chinese map, I should say Chinese menu, that enables areas to be clear the things they need and secure the funding to level up. One size fits all will never be optimal. And actually, we need to optimise the economic performance and the social improvement right across the realm. Our resilient economy, diverse communities, outstanding environment and world leading strengths in health technologies will enable us to play a pivotal role in not just the recovery of West Yorkshire or the North, but the whole country. Levelling up means implementing the systemic changes needed for our region to realise its potential. Government must engage with local leaders, including businesses, to make decisions that will enable the region to progressively become a net contributor to national wealth and no longer dependent upon the success uh, derived elsewhere that will hopefully benefit all the people of our region. And as I said, boosting productivity is the prize, albeit it's been a long term uh, 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 problem and difficulty. The city region is taking a leading role in skills-led economic recovery with our skills advisory panel, providing ex expert and informed input from a range of strategic partners. The West Yorkshire Skills Partnership also provides key contributions in providing a forum to better understand the challenges and operational realities of skills delivery and facilitate the sharing of best practice. Partnership is the, is the key word. Partnership to produce extraordinary, which become the new ordinary high level results. Our economic recovery plan set out our ambitions for an entrepreneur revolution in, to support our COVID recovery. And we're investing funds to generate that sort of spirit of innovation and entrepreneurship. To remind you, the recovery plan focused on three action areas and five propositions. Those action areas, good jobs and resilient businesses, skills and training, and accelerated infrastructure. To date, through the local growth fund, we've invested nearly £100 million in skills capital uh, funding from the £1 billion growth deal. And many colleges across the region, uh, Leeds City College, the Quarry Hill Campus, Kirklees, the uh, Process Manufacturing Centre, are a few that have benefited, together with the the innovation air activities at Nexus, the University of Leeds, uh, 3M Buckley, Huddersfield and Digital Health Enterprise Zone in Bradford. Uh, our recovery and long term prosperity are dependent on people having the right skills to get back into work or be ready for new opportunities and employers who recognise the value of developing their workforce. If the UK plan for growth built on the, th the three pillars uh, of investment to deliver priority objectives are to be fully re realised, we need to be part of that. We need to be able to deliver that plan for growth through our economic recovery strategy. And the future is around a skilled workforce being key, in the key ingredient to not only uh, extraordinary economic growth,
but actually an inclusive uh, growth for for all for all across our our region. We'll be part of a national solution, uh, not just not just a local implementation. I mentioned John F. Kennedy for those back in history and his view of the future, perhaps bring it a little bit more up to date with the words of the late David Bowie. And he said, tomorrow belongs to those who can hear it coming. We can not only hear it coming, but we know how we want to shape it up for, for all for all of the economy of West Yorkshire and the wider Lee City region. So thank you for listening. I hope you have a great conference and I look forward to seeing you in person on the day. Hello, my name is uh, Rashid Palmer. I chair the Employment Skills Panel for the Leeds region. Um, and you know, today I'm delighted to be joined by colleagues. And uh, you know, as we as we think about the employment skills landscape that we have today, it's changed dramatically over the last five years. Exiting the EU, you know, creation of the um, uh, the apprenticeship levy, um, the pandemic, and, and all of that has has really sort of given us huge challenge in the the amount of unemployment. Um, particularly amongst young people, um, profound impact on the workings of the local economy and, and the marketplace. So back in 2016, uh, we developed the Employment Skills Panel and really set out a vision for uh, what skills and better jobs will be. Um, we set out a number of uh, ambitions and I'm, I'm pleased that we, we achieved some, some phenomenal things. We, we secured the, the landmark 1.8 billion devolution deal. We're delighted to have the first um, mayor of West Yorkshire, Tracy Brevin. And, and at the same time, you know, we also started thinking hard about um, what do we want for the for the, for the region itself? Um, the Future Skills Commission really call for a very simplified and um, a symbolic um, skill system, uh, better meeting the needs of the individuals, helping us create the kind of economy that we want to be part of. And and really responding to some of the, the broader challenges that exist. Um, that, that report really provided a, a blueprint for what the future ready skill system should be. Uh, the nine recommendations were piloted in their city region and we're already seeing some of the benefits of that. Um, but we can't, we can't do that alone, right? We really need to work together. Partnership is fundamental to this. Um, the local authority, the further education institutions, the higher education institutions, and the independent training providers, but there's also an important place of the voluntary sector, the community sector, the businesses, all of us have to work together. And it's actually this collaboration which really gives me the, the confidence that, that we can do this um, and really provides us a, a, an equilibrium and, and, a, and a way of addressing some of the, um, uh, the, the, the challenge we have with low skills and, and opportunity. Uh, in fact, as, as over the last few days, we've been hearing about various reports in, in, in the press around, and around this as well. Um, another big example is, is, that, is, a, is a partnership we have with uh, the West Yorkshire uh, Skills uh, Partnership here as well. And it really acts as a voice to the sector and brings together some of the strategic partners. Um, and another fantastic example is, is how we deliver the own agreements with the, um, the FE colleges. Um, the first of, uh, of the, these kind of uh, national agreements aligned against our priorities and um, informed by the, the combined authorities labour market report, uh, which really looks at a whole market challenges and so on. Um, and this is, has led to us getting access to the uh, uh, 65 million de devolved um, AUB budget and ensures that we can deliver the right kind of provision for us going forward. Um, and I'm delighted to, to, to launch the, the, the new employment skills framework. We're informed by a whole bunch of consultations and engagement from local stakeholders and various um, uh, you know, parties and organizations and and and, and it, it, the survey was open to the general public and we got the voice of and opinions of um, employers employees residents organizations you know, across the whole network uh, what we're really doing is setting out a very strong vision for west yorkshire to become a world leading region where investment in skills the training, the education, really provided by strong support from employers. And um, this goes hand in hand to create that kind of diverse, inclusive, highly skilled workforce that can create new jobs, drive um, a kind of sustained improvement for, for the society, for the region, and really providing that kind of quality of, of life for all. Um, and, and we want the West Yorkshire region to be the place where 
there's no barriers to, to, to people taking up these, these opportunities, progressing and, and creating those skills. And we have employees that really recognize the value of diverse workforce. They invest in the talent, develop them, they build the skills that they'll need and, and really drive the productivity and, and effectiveness of the businesses. And um, we want individuals who really value lifelong learning. They, they, they care about that. They make their own decisions to make sure that they are the best in their field. They develop their, their careers in a way which, which makes, um, makes them feel proud and, uh, and, and feel that sense of accomplishment. Um, the, the, the same time, we also need the world-class teaching. We, we're, we're blessed with some great institutions and bringing those together is really sort of helps us uh, drive us forward. Um, the, the framework sets out five priorities um, the, and, and these, these are far-reaching ambitions around quality technical education, great education connections to business, access to progressing uh, good work, creating culture and, and driving innovation. The framework also recognizes that, that there are three broad themes. First is inclusive growth. Right? We have to make sure that we're reducing inequalities, you know, leveling up and, and, and that, that whole agenda of, of helping people that are locked in low skills, low paid work. How do we help them out, out, out of those problems? Um, the, the employment hub really provides a way of delivering that um, and creating the, the, the platform for future careers. Um, the actual skills network um, is going to be vital for West Yorkshire workforce to be upskilled um, and, and access to programs like Reboot um, that we're working in collaboration with West Yorkshire um, Consortium Colleges and uh, uh, Leeds Training University and, and, and Go Train. Um, the, the second cross-cutting theme is around net zero carbon. Right? And West Yorkshire has the ambition to, to, to really be the, um, the region where um, we, we can become net zero by 2038. And, and that's a response to the skills opportunity, the Green Skills Partnership, the roundtables, the forums. You know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of work there. And I think that that will create really meaningful and valuable jobs. And the third part is a cross-cutting theme around digital skills. Uh, something that's near and dear to my own heart. Um, ICT skills are fundamental. Uh, the, the skills opportunity and, and, and the, the growth opportunity for jobs is massive. West Yorkshire is, is growing phenomenally. It's, we, we've got 16,000 um, digital jobs in the sector, um, growing by 50%, outstripping the national pace as well. So we've got tremendous opportunity, high skills for things like SQL, Microsoft, C-sharp, JavaScript, you know, digital native, cloud native, you know, all, all those kinds of you know, modern jobs that, that can really drive us forward. And, and I always say, you know, you, we, we've got an opportunity for, for, for being the digitizers of the world, right? There is a huge lack of those skills and we've got a tremendous opportunity to, to access and create uh, tr you know, that, that, that kind of growth for us going forward. Um, and I think through that partnership, we could really drive this. So the framework gives us the opportunity to create skilled people, have, um, new jobs and really be the powerhouse for growth and, and, and be the digital powerhouse, the, the, the capability that, that helps us really create uh, inward income into the society. And, and hopefully, and, and I think we'll, we'll also improve the quality of life for all our residents. So I hope that, that this, this provides some, some excitement and, and uh, um, something to look forward to, because as we come out of the pandemic, I think we as a region have got a phenomenal opportunity to really become um, the, the region that is well recognized as using skills to, to break through some of these. So thank you. Welcome back colleagues. Um, I hope you enjoyed those messages and many thanks to our contributors for making those possible. Um, I can welcome here Sir Roger Marsh, uh, Chair of the Leeds LEP and Rashid Palmer um, from IBM, who is Chair of the Employment and Skills Panel, um, that are here to answer some of the questions that have been put through. Um, uh, one that uh, I'd like to open up with, Rashik, is um, what is the Employment and Skills Panel? Yeah, now that's a great question. And um, for those that aren't aware, as part of the LEP, we have a number of panels, um, and one very much focused on employment skills and brings together employers, key employers from the region, um, key um, education providers, um, and the, the members from the, the local authorities and, and the, um, the LEP board itself. And, and the team really focuses on developing the agenda that helps um, underpin the, the, the strategic ambition of the LEP itself to help drive growth, inclusive growth, um, help address some of the, the um, systemic issues that we've got in the region and, and leverage the 
um, the opportunity we've got from from taxpayer money into make those systemic change that makes makes the place uh, a much more effective in in creating opportunities for people to grow and and it, it really sort of takes on the the role of driving some of the um, the skills framework that we launched today the employment skills framework that we launched today and um, it also does a lot of work around understanding the labor market so we get the labor market stats we understand where the jobs are where the opportunities are and we try and tie those in and we try and pick out the specific interventions we need to have to to help make things move forward and a big part of that, of course, we drove the um, the Future Skills Commission, um, and uh, and and that was a that was a big part of of how we were trying to influence not just our region but also nationwide. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and so, uh, away from taxpayer money, our first question is: How can we support more employers to invest in skills? Yeah, right. maybe I take that one as well. And so, so Reg, do you want to take that? No, no you you start. Fine. Yeah, so, so, you know, I think it, this is about us really working closely with employers and the, the skills panel is actually a good starting point for that. And we start to understand what are the real issues that some of the employers face? What can we do? Um, and then also showcasing examples of where things really work. So, so one, one thing that comes to mind is how we're using um, unused levy funds, right? So what, what, we, what we're doing there is <clears throat> we've created that exchange where those who've got levy funds that haven't been used, rather than just going back into the, the, the central pot, why do we reuse that in the region? And it's connecting some of those things. So, so it's, it's providing simple, practical things that can be done at the local level that makes it easier for um, for local employers to, to find the opportunities for, the, for their staff to develop staff, and also those in the FE colleges to be able to you know, leverage the opportunities that, that are out there. So Roger? I was going to add that you know our approach throughout the last decade almost is to is to help mandate, not dictate, to business. And um, if I reflect on the local growth fund, which came to an end, uh, you know, this March, and the support for businesses, progressively, we've tried to make it a, a two-way street. It's not just a gift from the taxpayer so that you can grow your business and grow our economy and address some of the the structural imbalances like the productivity challenge, which I'll touch on in a moment. But actually, how about your obligation to to provide something back, work experience, consider apprenticeships, uh, engage with you know your community now about what sort of what sort of curricula do you see is going to be needed in the future, not just now. And so we've tried, as I say, to create that uh, conducive collaborative arrangement where there has been the incentive of taxpayer funding, but also the fact actually it's it's a win-win because uh, supply of skills for today and tomorrow needs to be matched, if not equally, but perhaps uh, additionally by the types of jobs that are available and will be available. And, and that links to our broader inward investment aspirations to say, you know, we've got a, for example, just slightly tangentially, we've got a, a, an emerging creative and uh, cultural uh, community and economy what what would really what would really spark it off well channel 4 would be an example so trying to make this complete as a whole system uh, and i'd also reflect if i may you know the, the the money that's gone into producing and creating the right sort of 21st century facilities for young people as well as others to retrain I think is part of the essential ingredients to create that uh, virtuous, a virtual, a virtuous circle of success on a sustained basis. So, um, staying on the uh, subject of businesses, I mean, how do we intend to include small businesses in this plan for growth? I think again, um, the likes of uh, the work of the careers and Enter careers and enterprise company. Um, the grant system I spoke to you about, but also he helping uh, them understand and, and, and them helping us understand how we will embrace these uh, these new opportunities. You know, let me take the net zero opportunity. On the wider north, we think there's something of a, in excess of 100,000 highly paid jobs potential. So how do we help these small businesses perhaps move into those areas and some of the programs of activity that are currently available and will become apparent through the devolution 
uh, now we've got an elected mayor, should hopefully help with that. But, but the one thing we can't do is to promise to help everybody with everything. You know, there's a, there's a limitation we need to focus. And that's why this new employment skills framework is so important um, for us to help employ, employers of all sizes and shapes and their representative organisations like the FSB, et cetera, to enable their, their members to take advantage so that we do really uh, inculcate uh, having engendered that culture of investment in workforce skills across all businesses. Uh, uh, absolutely, thanks for that. Uh, Rashid, before you come in, I, I think maybe I'd move to a slightly different question. Um, the Employment and Skills Framework references digital and green skills uh, as priorities for the future. Do we understand what these skills requirements will be? And do we know of businesses who need these skills um, and those will be providing those future jobs? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And um, you know, when I think about digital skills and green skills, um, you, you, we get insight from the labour market survey. So the labour market survey gives a very clear view of how those skills are progressing. Um, but I think there's, there's kind of two levels of the skills. There's one which is really transformational and helping us use digital to transform the way work happens, transforming how society um, you know, functions. In the same way, I think green skills will be used for transforming society in ways that we can't imagine today. So, so there'll be some very specific and high growth roles that will come along. And we're seeing the early stages. So when you look at the labor market stats, you can see you know, there's 14,000 startups we've got in, in, the, in the IT industry right now in, in, in the lead region. These are all driving the new skills. And you can see from the LinkedIn surveys, from the, the data on um, you know, job sites that we, 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 we trawl and, and gather that data, where the, the, the roles are emerging. Um, we also do conversations through things like the um, ESP, um, uh, the, the Employment Skills Panel, and, and also through the um, uh, employee engagement um, forums like the uh, Business Comms Group. We, we can start to get some insights at, a, at an industry level uh, and at actually at an organizational level where things are coming. So we've got a range of information sources to try and pull those together and, and try and use the early indicators as a way of figuring out where we should focus our efforts. Mm. And, and so, so I mean, it's certainly um, a lot is mentioned about digital skills and the new op job opportunities. The, the one thing that I always struggle with with green, the green economy is whether there are truly coming new jobs in the green economy or whether they'll be changed jobs for those existing in employment so for example will yeah. uh, will engineers just have a little bit of green within their job description rather than being um something brand new uh, have you got any thoughts yeah, that, that yeah I, th I think it's i think it's a bit of both I, th I think there will be significant new green jobs so when we think about for example um installation of uh photovoltaic photovoltaic, you know, the, the PV units and um, creation of um, charging points. Some of that will be completely new structures and new organisations that will go do that. Some of it will be existing organisations will repurpose what they're doing into those opportunities. But there is a, there's a massive infrastructure change that needs to happen. There's a massive change in attitude and behaviour. Um, and there's a change in the way businesses work as a result as well. So, so there are, there is a, this is a big change and it requires lots of effort. And, and I'm... I'm convinced of getting huge jobs. There's, there's been a number of reports that shows the range of new roles that will exist in the green economy that we, we, you know, we can't fully understand yet. Those are all thoughts from, from leaders and, and um, the experts. Uh, we, we're trying to translate that. And part of what we're doing with the, um, the green economy panel is understanding what those roles are and starting to predict that. So, so I work closely with, with Andrew, who chairs the Green Economy Panel. So we understand the skills needs and he understands where the ways that we can use those skills needs in the region. So working like with yourself and the, the FE colleges, with the universities, with the schools, so that we, we're preparing our young people also for those opportunities that come forward. Great. So, so, so Roger, um, as chair of the LEP, um, we appreciate your service. It's, it's all about partnership. Um, of different organisations, but if partnership is so important, how can that be encouraged to support the employment and skills priorities for West Yorkshire? I think, as I've said before, the, the partnerships, perhaps, perhaps three main parties, there's ourselves as, 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 a, as a local grouping, which includes the, uh, the local authorities and others. There's, there's 
obviously the business community of all sizes and shapes from global to local um, and also the central government and, and that that partnership has uh, has stood us in in good stead as i mentioned one of my earlier earlier remarks and in and in, and in the opening uh, piece um, what we now need to do which we are doing is 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 re reflecting what's actually happened you know in the last 18 months and ensure that people who are find themselves perhaps outside of the labor market how do we help them get back into it but but not just any job but the right sorts of jobs and and to Rashid's point about green um let's not forget one of our huge strengths as a region that we are a microcosm of the whole uk economy that, that that variety should be the key to our vitality, not not otherwise. So when we look up at Tees Valley and see what they're doing in terms of the whole hydrogen agenda, the the the, the, the turbine factories, you look at Humber. How do we make sure we're part of that essential supply chain and have the the, the young men and women and those at the other end of the scale, uh, um, re, re, you know, uh, retrain. For those jobs and that's where we, the, this framework is so important because it really is it really is the hub around which all of the other spokes uh, come off working with you and your other colleagues now to ensure that actually all of the ingredients that are needed as much as we can that can be publicly funded but not not exclusively so uh, are available and that's available to everybody with every sort of ability as well as perhaps those who have other needs actually they are it can be as productive and as fulfilled and that's the important thing the unfulfilled as as you know as all, as all of us and and you know we have to continue to keep working on it it'll never be completely done um uh now but, but mm. i think we've made a one hell of a good start in the last few years but then you might so you would say that wouldn't you <laughs> well um uh, you, you touched on it on in, in your uh reply there but how do we support entry level opportunities into industry um, and not just focus it on level three college and university routes you want to touch on that rishi briefly yeah um, i mean part of the things that we've been doing is, is for example the apprenticeship levy but the, you know, the apprenticeships are really important we have a range of schools advisors that help and support um young people into all kinds of employment and we have to be inclusive here, right? So this is about leveraging all the capabilities we have in the region to create employment for all, wherever wherever it's possible. So I know the FE colleges do a lot in that space, the third sector does a lot in that space, and it's helping people um, that, that are really helping create the opportunities for people as well. So it's not, part of the, the role of the, the LEP is also to be an amplifier. And it's picking out the ways in which we can do little things that will really amplify across the whole of the region. And, and those amplifiers are, are things that we're trying to pick out. And, and we use things like the Employment Skills Panel, things like the Business Comms Group to understand where those entry points are that we can we can learn from the best and then replicate that success so we can then you know, basically create the kind of place that we want to be part of. Many thanks, and I apologise. I wasn't looking at yours. I was looking at the questions coming through, and we absolutely are not going to get through all of them. I'm afraid. Um, uh, the tricky one here: for a true partnership to be effective, there needs to be parity in relation to funding, value, and representation. How will this be monitored and managed to ensure it's achieved across West Yorkshire? <laughs> I'm not sure there's enough time left in this whole conference to bounce <laughs> that. The, yeah. the, the essence is about how to achieve. A level of fairness, uh, and as as well as uh, achieving our economic and inclusive growth aims, and I think you know that that that's not an easy one. And I'm not going to try and pretend I fully know the answer. But what I am going to say is to set the prize. If, if we as a as a region were able to achieve the UK average um, uh, economic activity, we would add approaching 10% to the economy of the, of the city, wider city region. The win-win there is by doing that, we will have hopefully delivered much much better jobs, higher up the wage uh, range um, through resilient businesses uh, and there, thereby begin to attack the real challenge, which is actually everybody having a better quality of life. Now, the, the programmes that we have 
um, seek to address some key bits of that. Um, the whole wider leveling up agenda, and forgive my phraseology, if it's the right Chinese menu that I have in my head, will enable places like ours to say that's what we need. We, we need the full banquet and some. Other places might not need quite as much, rather than perhaps somehow everybody gets the same go at, at the menu, but actually you end up with a one size fits all that will be suboptimal to the overall agenda. And so, for example, um, in the air, for example, just in the area of research, you know, taxpayer funding of research in the north is massively outstripped by what happens in the York, the arc around Oxford, Cambridge, London. Well, we need to make good that first and then from that base level up rather than just use some of that as, as perhaps designated leveling up. So there may there needs to be a, a redistribution of funds in a way that doesn't disadvantage those areas that are already doing well, but advantage, advantages those areas that can do better to overall national benefit. And I think that's where the real trick is. And we'll be working hard to ensure that West Yorkshire and all of those, or those, you know, it, it, whatever stage in, in 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 the labour market, get the best chance at it. And we will, you know, uh, come back if I may close to this. The framework we're launching today seeks to set us further on that direction, which we commenced, uh, you know, a, a, almost a decade ago, and we and 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 has got us to this point. Um, where there's a degree of resilience, but it's not job done. It's just job sort of reasonably well begun. Solid. And uh, um, thank you very much to the pair of you. There's many more, more questions that have come in that I'm afraid we're not going to have time for. Um, but just a personal note of thanks to the pair of you for the, the effort that you put in to try and support the skill system uh, and make it work for the people of West Yorkshire. It's greatly appreciated and it's done above uh, and beyond your own day jobs. I know that. And Sir Roger might even say it's done without a day job, um, but it's greatly appreciated by all of us and your time that you took today. All, so, all I say is that re retirement can be as full as full time employment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. And so uh, now we're going to move on to our next set of presentations. Good morning, everybody. My name is Professor Shirley Condon, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Bradford and Chair of Yorkshire Universities. I'm delighted to be joining everybody for the Lead City Region Skills Annual Conference. If this year has shown us anything, it's the value of collaboration and adaptability in the face of a crisis. By working together and working to our strengths, we have achieved a great deal for our region. I'm particularly proud of the way that our education providers, whether they're further education, higher education or alternative providers, have responded to the need for materials, research and skills. Looking ahead, our focus is now on recovery, renewal, creating prosperity for all. The question we are now asking ourselves, both at the University of Bradford and Yorkshire Universities, is how can we be innovative, collaborative and inclusive? in our approach to the challenges and opportunities before us. Next slide, please. This slide gives you an overview of the Yorkshire University members across our region. Across our region and across the UK, we do not have equal societies. Where you grow up can have a profound impact on the rest of your life and your future success. These inequalities have been exacerbated, as we know, by COVID-19. And this is why the levelling up agenda is so important. In addition to the importance of social justice, of enabling individuals to reach their personal and professional potential, social mobility generates improved productivity in the workplace. At Yorkshire Universities, we work together and with colleagues across our region to ensure we are all doing everything we can to enable social mobility through education and economic growth. I'm particularly proud that the University of Bradford was named University of the Year for Social Inclusion in 2020 by The Times and the Good University Guide. And this year we were at top of the National Social Mobility Index for England. These accolades show that our approach is impacting on disadvantaged students who need the most support to achieve their potential. I would now like to offer congratulations to Leeds Trinity University, who has recently been awarded a What Uni Award for Excellence in Diversity and Inclusion. Next slide, please. 
As you can see from this slide, the 12 members of Yorkshire University are collectively producing over 68,500 highly skilled graduates each year, and over 31,000 of those are in West Yorkshire. As well as contributing to around 3 billion to the region's economy, our universities in West Yorkshire play a critical role in generating jobs, creating innovation, talent, enterprise and driving productivity. Next slide, please. Universities UK ran a campaign showcasing the way that universities have been helping to fight the pandemic. I'm sure that, like me, you are proud of how many of our sectors have stepped up to provide and universities were no exception. Whether this was research into vaccines, to treatments, to working on the front line of the health and care sectors or supporting our local communities. Over the past year, our universities in Yorkshire have played a critical role in fighting COVID-19 and getting us to where we are now. That support, innovation, research and practical help will continue as West Yorkshire moves into renewal and recovery. Next slide, please. Our university's research has helped us to better understand the virus. And there's been a joint effort to analyse the genetic code of the coronavirus, provide hospitals, regional NHS centres and the government with cutting edge tools to combat the virus. And thanks to these efforts, we now have a vaccine. The examples on this slide from the universities of Leeds, working with Birmingham and of Oxford, show how they've launched the first corona cancer surgery registry in the world. Leeds University are mapping the spread of COVID-19 to identify patterns across towns and cities, helping to identify what local measures help to prevent the spread of the virus. And there's other examples on this slide that you can read for yourself. Next slide, please. Universities have also donated or developed personal protective equipment, made laboratories and facilities available for further research and made additional capacity and resources available to support the NHS. Next slide, please. The University of Huddersfield has linked up with local manufacturers on the requirements for ventilators, so crucial in treating patients and Leeds Beckett University has been helping to train and prepare and skill up 1,000 new NHS workers during the pandemic, providing teaching spaces and catering facilities for the NHS. And the University of Leeds has provided staff and offered its halls of residence to healthcare staff and patients. As well as us at the University of Bradford, we've all supported frontline staff, getting our students out onto the front line as quickly as possible. The skills, resilience and values of our students and their highly skilled levels have shone through during this time. Next slide, please. Our commitment to supporting Bradford's economic recovery saw my university connecting with all of our graduates in the class of 2020 to offer career services and internship opportunities. This resulted in over 200 students being employed through the NHS and Bradford Council in COVID testing, in vaccination centres, engaging with local communities. And we also supported the Kickstart Consortium led by Bradford Council, offering 68 Kickstart supported placements at the university. Next slide, please. So some of the current activities. Yorkshire universities are contributing to the West Yorkshire Economic Recovery Plan by harnessing and sharing the collective knowledge and expertise of our academic research in our region, creating an understanding of the need for higher level skills and business needs and how these can be best matched. At Bradford, this has led to senior leaders in the university working with the local authority and business leaders to develop economic recovery plans. I've been personally involved with my colleagues at Yorkshire University in developing the West Yorkshire Economic Recovery Plan. And as a collective, our work across our universities, including healthcare, health digital, technology, wellbeing, climate change and levelling up, support the Mayor's priorities, including the West Yorkshire Innovation Framework. The key to this is getting the people with the right skills at the right time and being able to flex the workforces rapidly and we need to collaborate on this. Next slide, please. In March this year, the West Yorkshire Innovation Festival demonstrated the types of opportunities there are for businesses and universities to work together. 
the festival let the 180 participants, including 55 businesses, explore ways to collaborate with universities in areas such as healthcare, the creative industries, textiles, low carbon heating and cooling, existing skills gaps and future skills were a big focus of these sessions. Next slide, please. Higher level skills and the graduate labour market. Fellow university board members joined four regional LEPs and combined authorities across Yorkshire in a task force to look at the skills agenda. Agreement was reached that we must strengthen higher education business engagement in our region and improve the integration between innovation and the skills agendas. It was agreed that we need structured high and technical skills initiatives that are linked to innovation programmes across further and higher education. We need to accelerate leadership and management skills with a particular focus on key areas such as human resources. And we need to enhance the transition into employment of our graduates and do better at keeping them in our region, especially in SMEs. We must have a focus on ensuring that the salaries that our graduates receive is in line with sector averages across the country. Next slide, please. Close collaboration with further education within the skill system. Higher education and further education works effectively together to support social inclusion and widen participation amongst underrepresented individuals and communities. We still have a way to go on this. We still see groups of people underrepresented in higher education, especially at the moment white working class boys. Skills, workforce planning and lifelong learning are central to improving productivity and growth in key sectors and industries in West Yorkshire. Successful economies and places develop more relevant skills over the life course they use skills more effectively in work in society, and they have strong and robust governance of skills systems, and importantly, agile systems. So we need our skills system to be lifelong, almost cradle to grave. To get people into university requires efforts that start in nursery, in infants, infant schools, in senior schools, in further education, and ultimately in higher education. The importance of working across this pipeline cannot be underestimated. The availability of talent helps to attract business investment and to create more and better jobs. We must make use of the best talent available to us. But I must emphasize again the importance of starting with a whole systems approach that is a cradle to grave approach. Next slide, please. So look into the future. As we look ahead, you will not be surprised to see that research into key issues, including social care, economic recovery and climate change are a key part of our agenda. You can see from this slide that we will be working with UUK Social and Economic Recovery Getting Results campaign, which features Yorkshire the week commencing in the 9th of August. Next slide, please. The West Yorkshire Skills Partnership. In the areas with highest social mobility, disadvantaged individuals can earn twice as much as their counterparts in the areas of the lowest social mobility. These differences are not acceptable, and that is why we must level up. Lifelong learning and lifelong learning development skills at all levels are needed. We must drive a greater demand for improved skills. We must support mental health and well-being. And we must establish much more closer working with the West Yorkshire Combined Authority and support the Mayor's priorities. Many things that should not impact on our future economic success do, including gender, race, parental wealth and where we live. Education can have a significant impact on proving life chances, but inequalities persist even for those who have participated in higher education. The longitudinal educational outcomes data shows that on average, males earn over 14% more than females. And those who received free school meals earned on average 7% less than those who did not. 
I want to say something about the cultural sector and the importance of skills in crafts and the arts, which are in shortage. The economic value of the creative industry sector before COVID was worth 116 million to the UK economy, larger than the automotive, aerospace, life sciences and the oil and gas sectors combined. Significantly for a post Brexit UK, the creative industries exported 36 million in services, thereby helping to amplify the UK's soft power internationally. London and Yorkshire are two of the UK's creative powerhouses. The concentration of the creative industries in London is strong and Leeds City Region has the third largest share of employment in this sector outside the capital. We are looking to our Metro mayors as a valuable and influential resource to convey these messages to government and to drive the delivery of real action and impact on the ground. Just this last month, our mayor, Tracy Braben, the newly elected mayor of West Yorkshire, and Dan Jarvis, the mayor of South Yorkshire, pledged to promote and enhance and increase community participation in the arts, cultural heritage and the visitor economy in our region. This is so important. This focus will help universities to keep their focus on these important sectors. So in conclusion, Working in partnership is a fundamental to maximising the opportunities we have in the Leeds City region to grow our skills, to grow our economy and to create shared prosperity for everyone. I particularly want to highlight the positive impact of this inclusive network of skills providers to be able to deliver tangible and innovative solutions at scale. Thank you for joining today and I hope you enjoyed the rest of your sessions. Hello, I'm Louise Till, and I'm the Partnership Director at West Yorkshire Consortium of Colleges. The consortium was founded in 2002 by the Further Education College principals of that day. In the 20 years since, it's become an established partnership that has laid the foundations for future work with the Mayoral Combined Authority in responding to the skills needed by the region today. Seven colleges make up the West Yorkshire Consortium of Colleges partnership, which include Bradford College, Calderdale College, Kirklees College, Leeds College of Building, the Luminate Group, which you might know as Leeds City College and Kirklees and Keithley College, Shipley College and Wakefield College. The West Yorkshire Consortium of Colleges Board of Directors is made up of the college principals and NAV, who you've met, is the current chair. I was the first and for a long time only employee. Now we have a team which includes our project director, Joanne Patrickson, who many of you will know, and others in contracting, engagement and marketing. When the consortium was set up, it was constituted as a company, the college's company. Its stated aims were assist, to assist the colleges in West Yorkshire in meeting the further education and training requirements, drawing upon research carried out in relation to the skills requirements of the sub-region, to promote curriculum development initiatives between West Yorkshire colleges and to further these initiatives by encouraging joint bids to sources of funding, to assist in meeting the staff training needs of both academic and support staff, and to engage in arrangements with a range of contracting bodies as agreed by the Board of Directors. All are still current and important today. In 2010, the emergence of the LEPS and the City Region Administration meant that the consortium established a wider collaboration with the universities and independent training providers, the Leeds City Region Skills Network. A partnership agreement was signed between the network and the uh, combined authority and LEP in 2012, which set out the mutual ambition of fulfilling the skills needs of the city region economy and pledging a commitment to support individuals, employers and businesses to access the skills needed to achieve growth. Today, I feel we could add resilience to that as well as growth. The partnership, as you've heard, is now reformed and renamed as the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership. But those founding principles seem even more relevant today, especially in the light of the FE Bill current, currently going through Parliament. 
The Skills for Job Bill identified five areas for an FE system that meets the country's skills needs. Putting employers at the heart of the post-16 16 skills, providing advanced technical and higher technical skills that the nation needs, a flexible lifetime skills guarantee, responsive providers supported by effective accountability and funding, and supporting outstanding teaching. The West Yorkshire Consortium of Colleges model aligns perfectly to the government's proposed future model for post-16. With the colleges collaborating with, with each other, with universities and independent training providers, but also with employer representative groups, such as the Chambers of Commerce and others such as the Federation of Small Business, sector and industrial groups like the Manufacturing Alliance or Creative Skills, all in order to meet the skills priorities of people and employers in West Yorkshire. One of the ways we've done this is through our project work and the consortium has a strong track record of collaborative working on workforce development projects. There are a number we are currently managing, which include Reboot, which will benefit individuals to meet their full potential and enter roles in key growth sectors in Leeds City region, allowing individuals to develop new skills and progress their career. Higher performing workplaces, which offers training that it is designed to help businesses grow by developing internal travel tra talent, essentially an offer, a leadership and management skills offer to business. And let's talk real skills, which aims to make significant improvements in skills provision through collaboration between businesses and education. Let's talk real skills does this by working on a sector basis. It's formed 10 collaborative skills partnerships uh, in order to understand what is currently available and what the common skills gaps are. Those partnerships are in the construction, creative, digital, engineering and advanced manufacturing, health and social care, low carbon, med tech, rail, textile manufacturing and film and TV sectors. Working closely with intermediaries, stakeholders and employer groups, our team of skills associates identify the skills needed by SMEs and take the stepped approach to changing that skills landscape in order to better meet those businesses and employers' needs. Bridie and Bryony are going to tell you more about how these projects work and the challenges and learning we have gained from it. And finally, I want to say a personal thank you to all those I've worked with for many years some of you know that after 20 years and 10 chairs, I'll be retiring at the end of July. So this will be my last conference. There's a great foundation that's been built and I'm sure it will be the platform for future partnership work on skills that will benefit learners, businesses and employers across West Yorkshire for many years to come. Thank you all, Louis. Um, hand over now to Bridie Lunn. Thank you. Hello, I'm Bridie and I'm one of the skills associates here at WYCC and I look after the sectors construction, rail and low carbon. Um, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about employer engagement under the project Let's Talk Real Skills. So employer engagement is it's a term so widely used um, throughout all of our projects and public sector as a whole. And I guess for us, uh, employer engagement equals support. And we support loads of employers in different ways. One way of making training more feasible and financially accept, um, accessible. We sit with employers and do skills plans to really map out their business needs and understand where the skills gaps are to then slot in our funding. And these plans get referred back to as, as often as possible as when the company grows and changes and we can come and meet and adapt these plans. Our sector engagement forums and our collaborative skills partnerships are another supportive space for employers to come together at a table with colleges, universities, councils, trade bodies to really talk about the sector in their region and what the skills gaps are and essentially how we can map our funding um, and bridge those gaps. And that could be changes in curriculum, it could be um, updates in curriculum, changing in delivery styles, um, or even setting new apprenticeship standards, which we have done um, across our project for the different colleges. Our continuous engagement with these employers are essentially the fundamental roots at WYCC. 
um, and they really are at the heart of everything that we do, the projects that we currently have and the projects that we bid for. Of course, engagement, employee engagement isn't as easy as it sounds. Um, and, you know, it's challenging. Um, it's challenging to get the employers to give up some time in their busy day to, to sit down and speak to us and be able to share their business plans and how we can help. It's challenging to demystify some of the myths that employers have around funding and maybe some of the services that they've used before. And what we do um, essentially is we, we try and speak to these employees in all different kinds of ways and keep adapting to make our services more industry friendly. And some of the ways we've done that is, of course, going online and recording some of our sessions so we can send them out to employers when they've got free time in the day um, and they don't have to attend and come out of a busy office. We've had skills cafes in city centres so people can come and grab some lunch and have a chat about funding. Um, we've even met employers at 6am in the morning at the start of their day so it doesn't feel as interruptive at the middle of the day to come out and meet us and help for, hopefully that will save them time and money. We've also worked with large employers um, and we work with them to set up pop-up stands on construction sites in the pouring down rain, in wellies and hard hats to really speak to them and, and understand what their challenges are and to offer our services. And we've done all these things to help our services become more industry friendly and to adapt. And it's only made things even difficult with, with the pandemic. So even now, more than ever, employer voices um, are crucial. And we really want that employer voice to be at the table for when we're discussing changes to our curriculum and changes in the education system. Even now, more than ever, that time is, is valued across from WYCC and our partners. So these are just a few ways that we have adapted. Um, and I'm now going to pass over to Bryony, who's going to speak about all the exciting aspects that we've done from these employer engagements under Let's Talk Real Skills. Thank you very much, Bridie. Hi, everyone. I'm Bryony Cooper, Skills Associate for WYCC, and I take a lead on the engineering and manufacturing sector in Let's Talk Real Skills. So I'd just like to build a little bit on what Bridie's just talked about and give some examples um, of the great work that happens as a result of employer engagement throughout Let's Talk Real Skills and really how the pilots have taken shape as a result of this engagement. So Bridie mentioned the collaborative skills partnerships which take place across each sector. So this is an opportunity for members to discuss all pilots, um, all potential pilots and skills needs, but it's then these employer working groups that are formulated outside of the CSPs that really focus on industry specific skills and allow employers to contribute to the design and development of the content for their industry. So working groups um, have produced lots um, of ideas for pilots, but I just wanted to give you an overview of some of the pilots from the sectors that we're that we're currently working on. So the first one um, is from health and social care. So the health and social care sector have established several pilots, but something they've been working on for quite some time now is introduction to GP nursing. So the basis for this pilot um, was brought forward by the workforce and training hub based on their workforce statistics. So workforce data forecasts a steep decline in experienced GP nurses over the next two to five years. Um, work is being done to ensure that nursing degrees will now include GP as part of their student placements, but there's no defined route for existing nurses. So this pilot intends to bridge that gap for existing nurses. So once this idea was brought forward, Calderdale College and WYCC established a GP focused group to explore and consider this pilot, which was positive from the get go. And this ultimately has led on to the content of the course being co-designed with this group. And the fundamental basis of this pilot is to produce a registered nurse who has some core skills um, to be able to function in general practice, but supervise the non-registered nursing workforce and the new nursing associates. So similarly within engineering and advanced manufacturing, Wakefield College have established a working group with employees from the glass industry who were really quite keen to put in place replacement apprenticeship standards after the existing glass apprenticeships were due to be discontinued at the end of August 2020. So it's really quite apparent right from the get go, the employees came forward 
um, who already had some fantastic links with Wakefield College and said, what can we do? We, this is imperative to our to our industry and the future success of our employees. So through this working group that was established um, in this employer working group, Wakefield College have been able to understand the key roles and the granular detail of what employers need to be able to thrive in the future. So initial discussions were around glass processing, glass manufacturing, the differences um, and the employer contributions have been invaluable to the college in developing this pilot. Um, the discussions have unearthed the routes that the standard needs to focus on, separating out manufacturing and processing and how crucial it is to the industry that experts deliver these apprenticeships, um, giving the college a thorough understanding of the development work needed to make it successful. So Kirklees have also had great success in working with local employers. Um, they have two pilots under Let's Talk Real Skills and one of those is additive manufacturing. So Kirklees College have been working with local employers to develop a pilot which addresses the skills needs um, needed to support existing and future employees utilise this technology and in supporting the college one employer has actually offered a 3D printer um, as a donation to support this project and give participants on the pilot as much exposure to this technology as possible um, and this pilot's aiming to develop new provision in the additive manufacturing space, brand new provision. Um, the final one that I just wanted to give a bit of detail on was within the construction sector. So Wakefield College are working in conjunction with Consult DJH and iConsult Limited. Um, this is for a site operative pilot. So employee um, employer research carried out by CITB highlighted the demand for skilled site operatives. So together, Wakefield College are working with these two organisations in a partnership to deliver a pilot project to develop a training course which formalises the skills and knowledge required to be an effective construction site operative. And currently, there is no nationally industry recognised career path or qualification for the general um, construction site operative role despite this being essential to any construction site. So development of a course specific to this occupation will provide existing employees with proper recognition of their skills. It's just going to increase their career opportunities as well as providing them with additional competency in a range of different subjects. And um, this is also going to be great for new entrants into the construction industry. So they'll have a recognised career path that they can follow. Um, so as I mentioned, there are lots of other pilots in development too across Let's Talk Real Skills. Um, just to give you another couple of examples, Leeds College of Building, working with Northern Gas Networks to develop a future facing apprenticeship standard in green technologies and Bradford College as well. One of their pilots is to develop a study programme around modern building techniques, which is something the industry recognises as a, a required skill that they need now. So there's some fantastic work going on um, and all this great work really wouldn't be possible without the employer contributions that we that we come to grow and um and, and support and nurture and their expertise is vital in developing these pilots and supporting the colleges in providing the best possible curriculum for the future workforce so um, um thank you all very much for listening i uh, hope you're enjoying this morning we'll be back at 20 past 11. Uh, we're now going to move into a 10 minute break thank you
Good morning, colleagues. Or oh, good morning again, colleagues, and welcome back um, from your break. Um, I have the results of the online poll. I'm not sure how many people responded, um, but it, it says here that 9% um, of people were wearing pyjamas on the top. Um, it seems a bit, little bit disturbing. I literally took them off a minute ago, 3%, my word. Um, and in response to who won the Euros, only 50% are going for England. And uh, rather more disturbingly, 14% don't care. But say, Levy. Um, thank you very much for all the people that have presented this morning. Um, there's been some uh, very interesting uh, topics uh, covered. And I think one one thing that I'm picking up from the feedback that we're getting is that um, people are supporting a partnership and working uh, together. But uh, I think I'm more keen to see how that partnership is going to affect things on the ground. Um, I get back to my original um, question is, what do we want from a skill system in the region? And that if we can collectively phase the answers to those problems, that's going to help um, policymakers drive the right commissioning of activity so that we can support everyone that we want to support in the West Yorkshire region. Now, we kick off with one more presentation before Q&A session, and it's Alex Miles. Alex uh, leads the West Yorkshire Learning Provider Network, uh, which is a collection of uh, independent training providers who clearly support a lot of apprenticeships in the region. Um, she works tightly and, and is a part of the Skills Network board herself. So, uh, I look forward to hearing what Alex has got to say, and then we're going to meet her for a Q&A with the other presenters at the end. Thank you very much. Hi all, I'm Alex Miles, Managing Director of West and North Yorkshire Learning Providers. I just want to start by saying how great it is that this event is taking place and it shows the true desire of FE, HE and Skills wanting to work collaboratively together across West Yorkshire for the skills landscape. It was great to hear from both Tracy and Roger earlier, who have both supported different initiatives of ours over the past year with Tracy supporting our digital poverty initiative and Roger launching our Northern Skills Network company. So big congratulations to both Tracy and Roger on your first mayor announcement and Roger on your knighthood. So a little bit about us. We run a network of training providers across West and North Yorkshire um, across the FE and skills landscape. We support in excess of 90 providers, including independent training providers, colleges, universities and community learning establishments. We act as their representative body, their membership body and a single voice for all things FE and skills and post-16 education across Yorkshire. The vast majority of our members are independent training providers um, who deliver high quality, work-based focused and employer supported curriculum. Private training providers go mostly underappreciated or underrecognised at a local and national level because there is a misunderstanding and of what they deliver and the value of what they deliver. Locally, our providers deliver in excess of 75% of all apprenticeships and 70% of all traineeships and study programme. Plus, a plethora of providers deliver a wide range of adult education um, that move our communities into sustained employment. Last week at a conference, I heard that ITPs or private skills providers were the mop up of the FE sector. But based on those statistics, we are far more than a mop up and actually a fundamental cog in the FE wheel. The three main functions that our business operates is the network providing IAG and support for our members to develop the best response to policy and consultation and curriculum they can and act as their conduit between local and national policy and skills provider provision. We also have a contracts and projects arm which accesses funding from a range of sources so the smallest and most local training providers have opportunities to engage in skill and employability development programmes. And we also have a wide support service that we deliver across the country. We have clients from Southampton to Stirling that supports their quality improvement, their CPD, their Ofsted readiness, their, their um, governance and oversight, and ensuring that they can deliver the best possible curriculum available. 
We are also a represented network and I am a director of the Northern Skills Network, a company we launched last year as 10 regional provider networks to, who represent over 400 training organisations to support the levelling up and the skills development agenda across the north of England. Instead of me talking to you for 20 minutes, my brilliant apprentice Beth decided to develop a video that captures the hard work, dedication and resilience of our members, their learners and our sector across the last year. We have separated our video into five key themes. What our, what our members' response to COVID looked like, what our members are most proud of and the lessons that have been learnt, the future skills priorities and plans across West Yorkshire for our members, Wilp's response to supporting our network, and three words to describe the skills, the skills sector over the past year. I hope you enjoy the video. Last year's no, no doubt been difficult for everyone. Uh, we've made changes um, early last year, invested in uh, various platforms, which uh, enabled us to transition from face-to-face um, um, -face delivery to online. Um, it's been difficult. Obviously, we've been working throughout the pandemic. Um, mm. It's been challenging and it's also been rewarding. Um, last year, when when lockdown happened, we had a number of learners, our highest number, to go to university. So oh, wow. they were all working to actually ensure that they got the grades that they needed. Um, and we were really um, positive and motivated by the fact that they were, they were working to ASR. And we yeah. wanted to ensure that we were, when we go into out centre assess grade, that we didn't have to centre assess grade, that they actually produced the work that they wanted to put yeah. I think it's been a, uh, a mixed bag, uh, predominantly by sector. Mm. Um, so we work in different sectors which have been affected differently by the pandemic. So health and social care had its challenges, but actually we, we, we carried on working with lots of health and social mm -hmm. care settings. Um, I've got to say, obviously, it's very challenging times that we've just seen um, over the past 18 months. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, as I say, uh, really positive. We've been engaging a lot there with the learners. Um, employers are going through a tough time and looking at supporting mechanisms for them. But by and large, you know, um, employer uh, numbers are increasing. So we're going out there and doing, you know, quite some good work. I found it um, really encouraging, actually, considering all the challenges that have happened, but there are certainly opportunities out there. There's certainly been opportunities for people to enter the labour market or reskill. Um, it's been really encouraging to work with local employers and also other training providers where we find that synergy of helping young people and some older people get back into the labour market. take on the most difficult challenges, we take on the most difficult learners, we take on the most difficult sectors, um, you know, in care, in retail, which have had massive knocks. Mm -hmm. So we've come through that and that makes me feel proud that we're actually operating in sectors that need the help, need the support. Um, but there's nothing more fulfilling than taking it someone that feels they don't have a future all the doors are being closed to them and yet on the other hand you've got employers that are desperate for people not with the necessarily the skills but the, the passion the belief the, the desire to want to be better than what they are currently well for us obviously the transition there um, to ensuring we're keeping learning uh, keeping apprentices engaged Mm. The, um, the seamless transition has been the thing for us really that's what we wanted to make sure it, it works well and it has it's been fantastic um, but you know um, there, there are always little niggly bits mm. here there and everywhere um, but for us as well we're really proud of the fact that we never furloughed any staff yeah yeah with the learners achievement that mm. we can hand on heart say that they achieved 
yeah. what what we said that we're going to achieve you know and the planning and initiations that i mean that's all down to them and their commitment and the tutors but the achievement remained the same yeah um and it, it were a true reflection on everything that that we put in as well as their commitment um and it were an accurate you know response We've heard um, learners that have obviously struggled due to IT equipment mainly, mm. um, but um, we've tried kind of implementing um, resources, um, mm. mainly um, learning hubs to be able to enable them to learn really yeah. and come in. Um, some learners have thrived, so there's been some really nice uh, case studies of learners that weren't able to use IT and they've come in and they're able to use IT, they're now confident. Mm. They've even gone into jobs that have got um, IT mm. uh, that they use. I think the, the lessons learned are young people, a lot of people are more, much more capable um, than you sometimes can give them credit for. Um, and it's understanding the potential. And, you know, we always, we always value face-to-face -face delivery. We still value face-to-face -face delivery, but it's understanding how much more learning and support you can get in by doing some remote, things as well moving things online so for us it wasn't about being more efficient and doing things remotely all the time because people as humans we love engagement we love being social um but it's understanding how you blend that with the new technologies that come out and the new skills people are learning and so how do we get the best of both worlds here in fact you can you can get even more learning even more interaction and then blend it with some of that face-to-face delivery and support. I do believe that uh, this country will bounce back. Mm -hmm. I think it will bounce back really well. I see on a day-to-day -day basis the amount of young talent we've mm -hmm. got out there and we just need to open and explore that potential. Um, I think, you know, we talk about the digital age and we've got We've got, in terms of the country, I think we've got some of the best, brightest young people in that area. It's what they've grown up with. Yeah. Um, they've had that technology, most of them, all their lives. I think, you know, there's some exciting things coming out about digital, uh, bridging the digital um, poverty gap yeah. and those kind of things. Um, I think, you know, initially it's gonna, we're, we're going to be in a state of, of recovery mm. um, and it's about getting the skills and jobs that are needed now. Um, uh, I think companies will have to train and, and um, um, reskill people and mm -hmm. hire. Um, I think the pandemic's forced businesses to work in a completely different way. Um, I think technology is most definitely one of those things that has been integrated now into businesses. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's definitely a sector we're going we're gonna to focus on. Yeah. Staff, I've got the correct CPD in order to do the job properly. Um, but this all has to be in line with employers' expectations for mm -hmm. what they want for the future. But it helps us then shape where we need to be educationally, and that looks at the manufacturing landscape across uh, West Yorkshire. Yeah, and it's really important for us to keep uh, supporting schools and colleges. Mm -hmm. um, we need to plug that skills gap, it's huge yeah. Yeah. in engineering and manufacturing. I think. Before lockdown, we had invested a, a substantial amount in marketing mm -hmm. um, to actually grow who we are and, mm -hmm. and um, bring people up to date with what we're doing, why we do it, how we do yeah. it. Um, so we're, we're going to strive forward on that and actually yeah, we want to grow. put ourselves on the map, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Definitely, we need to get ourselves on the map because I think you know we're over the uh, Bradford South. We're not centralised. So a lot of people still don't know who Motivate are. Yeah. But we want to scream who Motivate The providers have given us much to be proud of during this time. Their response and resilience to the pandemic has been brilliant. And in response to this and to be enable greater support for the network, we have provided a number of initiatives to help them and support not only themselves, but also their learners. During this period, we held a number of initiatives, including the Digital and Tech Poverty Initiative, which we've partnered with Putty Computers, a local computer company established a sponsor, which was OneFile, 
to enable learners to be able to access the technology which they needed to continue their learning. Many across West Yorkshire struggle to be able to access their learning due to not having the correct handsets and technology to be able to continue their learning, which massively struck a chord with West Yorkshire learning providers. And so we established donations from a variety of sources, which were then refurbished and issued out to the learners most in need. We launched the Don't Wash Your Hands of Apprentices initiative as well to enable apprentices to remain on their programme and complete. During this time, we launched our first ever wellbeing festival, which was supposed to be face to face, but we quickly changed that to be online, which we partnered with Cash Alumni for to provide learners and employers and practitioners the much needed skills they needed to protect their own well-being during such a challenging period of time. Many learners had suffered during this time from stress and anxiety. Um, isolation had played a massive part and impacted on their mental health and well-being. This was a practical way to address those issues and provide them with tips for self-care. During this period, I've qualified as an LGBT trainer and as such worked with eight schools across the West Yorkshire districts to provide upskill as to greater inclusion for LGBT individuals within their establishments and also how they could drive up greater inclusion um, through their curriculums. We offered a variety of CPD which ranged from digital skills right through to audit and compliance as well as local updates and sector updates so that all practitioners were able to gain the knowledge and skills that they needed and each provider could change and adapt their provision as needed to support their learners. During this period we've increased our stakeholder engagement and we have provided members with multiple opportunities to engage with Job Centre Plus, which we now hold meet and greets every quarter to keep updated as to the skills needs and challenges and opportunities within each area. We've conducted employer roundtables to enable greater insight into what employers' needs are, what the challenges are for them and how we can address those within the areas. I think one of the areas I'm most proud of is how we've adapted the AS programme, uh, which stands for Apprenticeship Support and Knowledge for Schools, and how we've been able to still give students, teachers, parents and carers the knowledge and awareness around apprenticeships, T-levels and traineeships. You know, we've delivered to sessions to 120 schools, whether that be pre-recorded, live broadcasts on Teams, Zoom, things like that. And I think it just shows that you know, we have had to adapt fast and we did and it's been successful. During this period, I've also completed my Level 3 Business Admin Apprenticeship to a distinction standard and I'm now currently on my Level 4 Project Management, which is going really well and I've been able to implement the learning that I've taken from completing my um, Project Management Apprenticeship into some of the projects and initiatives that we've run at Wilp. I'm sure you will agree that Beth has captured the essence of our members and how well they supported their learners and employers. We are immensely proud of our members and it was humbling to be part of developing this video. One of the areas that we are most proud of is supporting the number of people to go through CPD during lockdown. A lot of our sector had been furloughed 
or were intermittently furloughed. So we wanted to do something to support them while they were um, at home. So we decided to open up our um, CPD and webinar support to not just our members, to everybody in the sector. We didn't charge for a single support intervention last year throughout 2020 and into 2021. We supported over 550 people to go through some form of CPD and webinar from quality improvement to LGBTQ awareness to audit and inspection readiness, safeguarding and staying safe online, to name just a few. Some of the plans and priorities we have for a year, the year ahead with working with our network, our members and our key stakeholders. We are supporting the, the, the development of the devolved AEB offer and the local skills improvement plans with our members. We are a named partner in the LSIP bids through the Chamber of Commerce for West Yorkshire and North Yorkshire, and we are fully supporting a local skills plan initiative. We are also supporting our members to deliver their a AEB uh, curriculum so it really truly reflects the needs and the demand from the communities that we serve across West Yorkshire. We have also established a green and green skills and sustainability working group with training providers, employers and key stakeholders from across the sector looking at ways of greening up the curriculum. I have developed an education for sustainable development health check for local businesses and training providers to use as a method of starting their journey on the sustainability road um, and help them respond and implement to this agenda. We are launching our social mobility and inclusion support program, working with key charities and partners across West Yorkshire and the wider sector and Yorkshire to address social mobility and diversity and utilising apprenticeships and traineeships and other education pathways to encourage more communities to get involved in education and work. We also want to ensure that by addressing social mobility and diverse diversity, it allows our members to have a truly inclusive learning environment locally. This work includes hosting LGBTQ peer support networks, utilising and implementing the Bradford for Everyone Inclusive Employers Toolkit, lobbying to address the apprenticeship wages poverty crisis currently taking place working with MENCAP to support their mission in making apprenticeships more inclusive and accessible for those with a learning difficulty or disability. And working with our patron member Cognosis to ensure that no learner is left behind and providers can better respond to, to the neurodiversity needs and challenges across our sector. We have commenced a project working with local army and cadet groups across Western North Yorkshire to provide better support for ex-forces personnel and working with local cadet groups so they can better understand the education opportunities and pathways available for them. And we will continue to support the Armed Forces Covenant, which we were proud to become members of last year. We will continue to host our provider and ESFA and employer roundtable discussions, addressing key themes within apprenticeships and traineeships. Our last session held in May, talk to the agency about the issues apprenticeship providers are facing with learners not staying on programme. These roundtables are a great opportunity for our members to discuss directly with the skills funding agencies any issues or challenges they are currently facing. We will continue to engage with SMEs locally to promote the benefits and do myth busting activities to encourage more take up from local small businesses and local young people to support apprenticeships and traineeship programmes. And this is an activity that we are doing not just across Yorkshire, but with the full Northern Skills Network behind us. We will continue to develop and grow our school engagement work through our ASK project. You heard from Beth mention we work within excess of 100 schools and we want to develop and grow this so it gets back to our pre-COVID rates of between 170 and 200 schools per year where we deliver apprenticeship um, interventions. Later this month, we are also holding our first School Leavers Opportunities event in partnership with our members to provide young people with a range of opportunities and vacancies currently available and those that will be available in the coming months for them to apply for. We also have some current apprentices talking about ways to apply for apprenticeships, how to make yourself seen to employer and sell your benefits. 
We are also a named Restart Strategic Partner for West Yorkshire, so look forward to that programme kicking off and supporting those who have been unemployed for more than 12 months, linking them to local skills providers and developing a local skills curriculum that leads to sustained employment. That's all from me for now. I hope you enjoyed our members video. I want to say a huge thank you to Beth again and our members for being involved. As you can see from this slide, we are a small team, but we love what we do and we punch well above our weight. So please get in touch with me, share your stories, share your experiences and join us for our busy year ahead on developing skills and inclusive learning environments across West Yorkshire. Thank you. Three, two. Hello and welcome back colleagues. Um, thanks to Alex's team for putting together that video, remarkable thing. Um, several of the presenters from this morning are gathered together. Um, if you could introduce yourselves as you get started, please. Um, the first question I'd like to put to Shirley, please. Um, how do you think technology will change what we deliver as providers? Yeah, th thanks, Nav. Um, I think you said to introduce myself. So I'm Shirley Condon, Vice Chancellor from the University of Bradford and Chair of Yorkshire Universities. So I think technologies are really advancing rapidly, rapidly, rapidly. We all know that um, industry is adopting many things um, um, at the same time. Artificial intelligence, we can think about robotics, uh, genomics, um, augmented and uh, reality and virtual reality, you know, 3D printing has been around now for a long time. And I think the technologies mean that the way that we deliver skills teaching, whether it's uh, at any level, has got to really adopt the technologies as well. So we can find that we can use different platforms. We can actually use virtual and augmented reality in our teaching. We can use simulation. We can bring about um, the students' ability to be excited by digital um, in very, very many different ways. But I think the one thing that we need to make sure when we're thinking about the impact of digital uh, in the delivery of teaching and supporting students to develop skills is that it does have to be inclusive. And we've got to remember where the students are coming from and assess their baseline so that we don't um, exclude anybody through trying to jump ahead of what their, their, their baseline is. And I also think that we've got to make sure we've got that balance between technology and people. You know, a lot of the decisions require consideration to issues of equality, diversity and inclusion. And we've got to make sure that, um, you know, through the development of um, algorithms and blockchain, we don't inadvertently um, um, embed um, exclusionary uh, practices. And I think finally as well in the development of decisions, you do need people to be able to get together to debate and discuss. So the technology has got to go along with making sure we get people together in appropriate venues. Right, and, and if you could come up with a course on what blockchain actually means, um, I'd, I'd appreciate <laughs> that personally. And does anybody yeah. else want to chip in there with uh, any different points? I think just in the terms of the adult education, um, we focus a lot of new tech around young people, but for our adults to move into the new jobs and the future um, roles that we need to invest in in, in supporting tech um, for our adults that, that can't currently access it and therefore are holding them back from entering the, the employment market. So it's, it's not just about the skills for young people for the future jobs, but the skills for our, our adults, our unemployed or our underemployed adults currently existing in West Yorkshire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and no, no, no. Uh, sorry. I was, was going to say, no, there might be a, a point to make which might link to a later question, which is, you know, to develop the technological resource you need to deliver um, skills, digital skills, it can be very expensive. And I think there's something to be said for us thinking about how collect, how a collection of um, providers, skills providers, could combine their, their resources to, to deliver more impact. Mm -hmm. and that's an interesting that one, that because, uh, I mean, if you get several CEOs in a room, it's difficult enough managing them, but you put several network managers in a room and that will <laughs> help to break loose. Um, but uh, Alex, I think that you, you touched on it uh, in, in your previous answer, but I mean, uh, how do you think we can support those furthest from the job market? Um, and, uh, I'm thinking here that it came up earlier is that idea that a lot of those entrance qualifications at level three and above, um, have, what, what can we do as a sector to help everyone take part in uh, society? 
Yeah, I mean, I think our responsibility, and particularly us as the network, is to to raise awareness of of the of the issues with those entry or they're sometimes called basic skills. And actually, I think language and terminology is not helping the situation. Um, these are essential skills that people need to get onto the employment ladder um, or to you know move on to their next career. So I think there's more kind of due care and consideration needs to be used locally with terminology and language effective utilisation of the devolved adult ed budget and making sure that it really does support those um, people that actually need it and not just focusing on higher level. There seems to be a bit of a, um, a, a, a split between it's either higher level or special educational need and it's that for, forgotten 60% in the middle that we need to ensure that locally we support through our networks and through the funding available. Mm -hmm. And that is interesting because we've got a limited funding resource, um, but it could be that providers might opt to take the lowest hanging fruit, that the, the, the easiest mm -hmm. people to deliver with are the ones where you can get the volumes from. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, a lot of those uh, groups of people, from ex-offenders through to um, ex-substance abusers, um, through to those with higher level needs, are supported by the VCS system. Um, Louise, how do you think the, the, the skills partnership can support the voluntary sector better? Um, I think through again, sort of it's 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 not easy, I suppose, is the, the first thing to say. I think one has to re find those people who are able to represent the voluntary and community organisations because they're quite that them them they are many there, there there are very many voluntary and community organizations but they are quite disparate so you, you you do have to reach out and search them out and find them but they have an incredibly important voice um to 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 listen to because as as you were saying there are many people and groups who are uh, a long way from from accessing that learning and who then form that pipeline that go all the way through but it it is about sort of that un, I suppose constantly searching out and reaching out to to find who those groups might be and where they are maybe represented, and an opportunity like this today through the conference is is to make those connections. I think we've always had the members on the on the board who who have got those network organisations, but we've always had this wider. Uh, this aspiration to reach out to to the to the wider group. Um, I, I know we've over 160 people live on the conference today. So if any of them are representative of those voluntary and community groups, this is your way to link into us and to to get your voice heard. So please give put those messages through and connect through to us through through the website. The, there'll be a page, the West Yorkshire Partnership page there. That, that can uh, have people's voice, enable people's voices to be heard, which which is really important. Mm. It, it, we have found it difficult, haven't we? Find it, trying to find a single voice for the voluntary and community sector. I mean, I suppose it's because it's so large. I mean, have you got many VCS members, Alex? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got we've got a handful. It's certainly not representative of, of everything that the voluntary sector does locally. But we certainly have. Um, a handful of providers and I think with regards to working with kind of the ex-offenders there there are entities out there that we need to learn from locally for example Tempest Novo or Clean Slate Solutions they want to work more with skills providers utilizing the AEB budget um, but there just seems to be more barriers than open doors at the moment so I think that's something that we're working on as a network but this partnership also can can look at the um, the wider kind of vol and comms sector and, and even if they're not from education and learn lessons of how to support those most disadvantaged from the labour market. Hmm. And any other thoughts? I mean, no, well, uh, my observations from, um, from a Bradford perspective is that um, I think there's an increasing more um, coordination in, in the voluntary sector and certainly during COVID-19, we've seen that the, the strategic um, oversight groups that have been supporting the response locally have been well connected into to the voluntary sector. And I think if we can pick up on some of the best practice that we've seen during COVID-19, where we've really seen a, a more coordinated uh, effective approach i think we would we would benefit from keeping that going mm -hmm. no, and, and it is amazing what we achieved during the uh, 
the, the lockdown periods and to, I mean, if someone had set that out as a project this is what we're going to achieve by the end of this the next two months um people would have laughed in your face but, yeah. but somehow we turned it but uh, it's the urgency that allows it to happen doesn't it um what we're trying to do is come up with a coordinated response when we're not on a kind of semi-war footing yeah, yeah. But I, I guess, you know, though, now, when you think about the, I think there is an urgency around the skills agenda, especially uh, as, Alex, as Alex is saying, you know, those people that have fur furthest to earn, the real, you know, desperate need actually to get people qualified in level two and level three in these skills. I think we should see it as a bit of a, an, an emergency situation and think how many hours have we got to uh, resuscitate the patient? Mm -hmm. um, and let's mm -hmm. put a bit of, uh, a bit of uh, firepower behind it. But it's, it's it's a tricky number though, isn't it? I mean, we've had one question here, so um, and uh, please chip in anyone that wants to respond. Apart from technology to access online participation from students and learners, so apart from that, what else do you as a network want funding contributions for? <laughs> Don't ask educators what they want funding for. <laughs> I think we have to, though, because I think as a partnership, we've got to come up and with a set of demands, we've, we've got to be able to express what we want. Yeah, I guess we've I got think to we've made it quite clear in the... Sorry, Shirley, you go. No, 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 you... I was just saying, I think we made it quite clear in the our response to the Mayor's skills pledges about what we actually want um, to happen locally around digital and green and what, what, the, what the Mayor means by... Um, better jobs or or high quality jobs. So I think we, as a partnership, have made a first attempt at responding to that challenge. I think um, last week we launched a level two and below survey to our members to capture some of that local intelligence about the importance of level two as that second stone into employment. So then we can use that data to help lobby or shape, um, you know, the local local funding. I think there's more that we can do collectively. Um, and bringing in our, our partners to, to respond to that. But I think the first attempt is that response to the pledge, which I think, you know, will be good to share with, with the West Yorkshire, you know, education landscape to see, you know, our response to that. For sure, for sure. So um, uh, that's about supporting individuals. Um, but quite often we get to talk to large companies and try and support their skills needs. But often there's a whole network of SMEs beneath that. Um, Joanne, any, any thoughts on how best we can get in there to support those SMEs? Yeah, certainly. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, Joanne Patrickson, I'm the Project Director at West Yorkshire Colleges Consortium. Um, certainly what we're doing is Let's Talk Real Skills um, and our collaborative skills partnerships where we've got employers and providers working together uh, to identify and develop those new skills and what's needed to manage the or, you know, help support the skills gaps over the next five years. Um, that's very much around supporting small businesses. And even though if you know be going beyond the funding, we're hoping that the Let's Talk Real Skills is a real catalyst for this collaboration to continue and for us to be able to continue to pilot what is needed with the new provision um, with across the Leeds City region. We certainly got a plethora of various different programmes uh, that we've got um, that have been mentioned by colleagues before all about supporting small businesses. But it's actually really understanding and identifying them on a like a business to business basis. So we heard from Bryony this morning and Bridie, um, we were talking about undertaking skills plans and having that skills conversation, which is so important. And each business is different and their own skill requirements are very different as well, aren't they? Um, but also kind of, uh, you know, Bridie talked about going on site and doing the skills plans at 6 a.m. in the morning because it was right for that business. So it's keeping that conversation going because there is funding there to develop the, uh, that knowledge, but it's really about making sure that it's, um, it's, it's right and it's appropriate for for every type of uh, sector and every type and size of business as well absolutely and um, I, i'm sure some of the rest of you would like to come in but um, time has gone very very quickly um we're getting ready now for the next few sessions um but before we do um we've had 11 skills network conferences hopefully we'll have another 11 skills partnership conferences and um, but one of the key people behind making all this happen is our uh, Louise Tell, who sat there at the bottom left of my screen, and it just so happens that she is retiring um, <laughs> next month, and we'll all be saying goodbye, and we'll all be the worse off for her leaving. So um, here you go, you've got your skills providers in front of you. Louise, can I embarrass you? 
say a few words. You've got 30 seconds worth. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it's it's marvellous. I love FE. I love this sector. Um, I think there's uh, this region has an awful lot to um, be grateful for and a lot that it can um, really grow from. We've got a platform here and I think you said it before, there aren't many regions across the country that have got this partnership and this collaboration. We're stronger together. So um, I wish you all the very, very best. I, I love this job. I um, love working with you all. Thank you. Brilliant. You take care of yourself, Louise. We're all the poorer for you leaving. <laughs> um, and now, so now we're looking more towards the future with two very interesting sessions. Um, and we'll be back for a Q&A in half an hour. Let, let the cameras roll. And thank you very much for your contributions, everyone. Hello, my name is Andy Goulson. I'm director of the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. Uh, I'm also chair of the Leeds Climate Commission and a professor at the University of Leeds. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about climate change and net zero, the desire to uh, remove our carbon emissions from our region uh, and its implications for employment and skills. Um, before I start, just a few words on the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission. We are an independent commission. We were set up just a few months ago uh, with the support of all the local authorities across the region and many businesses and large organisations too, uh, to support ambitious climate action across Yorkshire and Humberside. Uh, we include a team of climate leaders from across the public, private and third sectors, uh, and we are the largest regional commission of its kind in the UK. Uh, so our job is to support and guide and track progress towards net zero carbon emissions, amongst other things, in the region. Um, we have four goals, actually, not just net zero. So one is to do with climate resilience and how to make our region resilient to the current and future risks and impacts of climate change, including things like flooding uh, and forest and moorland fires uh, and droughts and so on. Uh, net zero is all around the energy use of our houses, our transport, uh, our industry and, and also our energy systems. Uh, we also have a focus on just and inclusive transitions, which is how we can make this a fair transition that leaves no one and nowhere behind. Uh, and when we look at employment and skills, that's a key aspect that we'll come on to talk about in a second. Uh, and then lastly, we're not only concerned with the climate change crisis, we're also concerned with nature and biodiversity uh, and making sure that our response to climate change also helps us to redevelop our green spaces and our wildlife and so on. So zooming in on our carbon footprint and on the net zero aspect, uh, as a region across Yorkshire and Humber, we emit 7.5% of UK emissions. Uh, so that's more than eight EU member states. So we're a big deal in carbon terms, but there is no regional coordination uh, of our response to climate change, which is why uh, we're here as a commission. Um, our emissions have fallen quite rapidly in the last 20 years or so. Uh, in fact, they've fallen by 41% since 2000. So that's really good progress. That's really welcome. Uh, and pre-COVID, they were falling at about 3% a year. But we know that to stay within our share of the global carbon budget, uh, our emissions as a region need to fall by more like 12% a year. Uh, so that we need a, a rapid acceleration in our decarbonisation efforts. Uh, that's a massive challenge, undoubtedly. Some of that will happen through national policy. But as a region and as all of the localities within the region, we need to add to that. Uh, and take the lead uh, and, and shape our own future in climate terms, as it were. At the moment, as a region, we spend over £10 billion a year on energy. That's for all of our energy for transport, for housing, for industry and so on. But the analysis says that we could save £2 billion a year just by doing cost effective carbon cuts. So imagine if there was another opportunity to bring in £2 billion into the region what we would do to move uh, mountains to, to attract that kind of inward investment or that kind of economic activity here. Uh, and what we would say is we need to do the same on this agenda. We need to be really ambitious and energised and positive about cutting our carbon because, you know, it can make us money. But as we'll see in a second, it can also help us in all sorts of other ways, as well as cutting our carbon footprint. Now, in order to unlock that kind of benefit, we need investment as a region uh, of £1.3 billion pounds a year. That's an enormous amount of money to be mobilised to enable us to tackle our climate uh, agenda. But if we were able to do that, and there are lots of signs that we can do that in different ways, 
then that would create 328,000 years of employment within the region. So the green agenda is a massive driver for growth and recovery and leveling up uh, and so on. Uh, it shouldn't be seen as a challenge or a threat. Uh, it should be seen as an opportunity. Um, 328,000 years of employment, that's 30,000 jobs for 10 years. And these are good quality green jobs as well, well-paid jobs in the region often. So it's a massive opportunity for job creation. But when we look at our existing employment, then some of our jobs uh, will see demand for their skills rise as a result of the transition towards net zero carbon emissions. Uh, and some of them will see demand for their skills fall. So the analysis suggests that 241,000 jobs across the region will see demand for their skills increase uh, because of the, 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 um, the net zero transition. And th these could be you know, builders, electricians, plumbers, retrofitting houses. They could be energy experts. They could be offshore specialists with offshore wind. Uh, you know, there's a wide range of different green jobs out there. On the other side, we could see that um, demand for jobs, for some jobs in the region will fall, especially in the high carbon sectors, high carbon industries like aluminium, steel, glass, concrete, uh, and so on. And the forecasts say that nearly a quarter of a million people in the regions could see demand for their skills drop as a res result of the green transition. Uh, and the, the just element of this and the inclusive element says where well, we really need to provide support to those quarter of a million people to enable them to reskill, to enable their, their sectors to transition towards net zero more effectively, uh, and to enable the areas that depend on those jobs to uh, thrive in the future low carbon economy. However, analysis also suggests that uh, skill shortages could be a major factor in slowing down the rate uh, and increasing the cost of decarbonisation. So the graph on the right that you can see here is from something called a climate uh, readiness assessment, uh, which we conducted in Leeds last summer. Uh, and what it shows the inner circle is how ready we, we are, stakeholders in the city think we are, to achieve a low level of decarbonisation in the next few years. Uh, and the, the dark green shows that the areas where we're most ready uh, and the red is the areas where we're least ready. And then the middle layer is a, a middle level of ambition in, in terms of decarbonisation uh, and the outer layer is the highest level of ambition. And in order to stay within our carbon budgets, we need to be on the outer layer. But you can see there that one of the the main areas where there is a limit is delivery uh, and delivery includes skills uh, and the availability of skilled labour to, for example, decarbonise tens or hundreds of thousands of houses a year and upgrade our buildings and our transport systems and our industry and, and invest in new renewable energy and so on. Uh, and so, you know, this really highlights that skill shortages are the key blocker uh, that will prevent us from, from realising our, our, our low carbon ambitions. Now, policy could play a major role in addressing that. Policy stability in having clear targets and clear deliverables, coupled with the appropriate resources to deliver on this, could create confidence uh, that, that you know, employers would need to invest in skills development. Uh, and I have to say, in many areas, we still don't have that policy stability, especially at the national level. There's a lack of clarity beyond a broad target on exactly how we're going to deliver on this uh, and that means that people are not investing in skills development in the way that perhaps they ought to. Now, there's been a lot of activity in this space in recent weeks, and the CBI, uh, who are a member of the Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission, prepared a really interesting report on how to tackle this issue, how to promote green jobs uh, as we move forward. And here, <coughs> excuse me, they provided uh, six key interventions which they think are necessary to build the skills and um, enable uh, the supply chains to emerge to deliver on this massive challenge of tackling climate change. The first one that they suggested was that governments should support jobs and skills hubs uh, in sectors and areas most at risk. Now, now we're lucky in the region in that we have mapped those areas at risk uh, and people like the TUC and the CBI but also others uh, have identified the hotspot areas geographically and also the hotspot sectors where we need to provide targeted support to enable uh, jobs to be protected and people to transition into greener jobs uh, more effectively. 
Next, they suggested the government should develop the school's skills toolkit, toolkit excuse me, uh, to support the development of skills pathways into green industries. Uh, and here we see, you know, clearly um, demography is a factor, but for many um, uh, younger people or mid-career people, uh, having the opportunity to transition from a high carbon job to a low carbon job could be quite crucial uh, in making the most of this, this enormous opportunity. Uh, and the skills toolkit and these pathways could be crucial and they're not adequately developed yet to enable many people to do that. Next, employers should promote green career paths uh, and link to schools and colleges to offer support to all young people in growing green sectors. So again, there's this link needed between schools uh, and colleges uh, and universities uh, and employers uh, and you know, the credibility of the green sector is, is growing, you know, it's six or seven percent growth rate every year. It's one of our boom economy areas. Uh, people should feel confident by committing their future to working in that green sector in different ways. Uh, but we need the, the, the institutions to develop and promote those career paths to build that level of confidence. So, so also the government then suggests that uh, or CBI call on government to uh, support the training needed in priority green sectors. Uh, such as renewables, such as water and nature based solutions, uh, such as uh, household retrofits and so on, uh, and to help these, these industries to meet government decarbonisation targets. Uh, so training support is needed, policy stability is, is needed, and a, a, a general injection of confidence is needed to enable uh, these sectors to take off and to uh, have the confidence to invest in skills in the way that is required. CBI then call on the National Skills Fund uh, to provide the skills and training for individuals both in and out of employment and to support transitions into new green jobs. So this needs to be integrated much more actively uh, into the skills and training agenda than it has been thus far. And the key element of that is around institute, uh, excuse me, around apprenticeships uh, and technical education, where CBI call on the Institute for Apprenticeships and Technical Education to uh, use their ongoing review to engage with employers and sectors to understand uh, the skills needed uh, in the green economy. So with those kind of measures, we could have a really bright future uh, in terms of green jobs in the area. But without the, those kind of measures, then we may miss out on a massive opportunity, but perhaps more crucially even, you know, not decarbonise at the rate required to stay within our carbon budget. So Yorkshire and Humber Climate Commission will be working on this agenda as we move forward. We have a future economy panel. Uh, employment and skills is a key part of that panel. Uh, and just transitions and this need to take everyone with us on this journey as we move into the green economy uh, is wired into the DNA of the of the Commission uh, and will be a recurrent theme to make sure that uh, all people in the region have access to the training needed to enter into the green economy uh, in the way that we've said here. So thank you. Thanks Nava, thanks Andy. Um, that's really interesting to watch. So my name is Mandy Ridgard, I'm, I'm the Chair of Space Hub Yorkshire and we're a new initiative for Yorkshire looking at how we further develop space and businesses and space skills within our region. Just to give you a little bit about where we've come from, um, we started um, before Christmas with a call from UK Space Agency um, and Leeds University, supported by the LEP, put in a bid to win some funding um, which was successful. That mapped, um, helped us to map our landscape, to put together a leadership team to push that forward. Um, and in doing so, we've worked with businesses, Yorkshire universities, research in institutions and our national and regional policy to develop a strategy document which will be going live um, later this month. So first of all, why space? Well, it's not all about um, a man in a suit, although it is interesting to note that uh, the first astronaut in Britain was from Sheffield, Helen Sharman. But space technology um, hits every part of our everyday life and lots of different sectors. So we're using space technology today in this virtual summit. We all have a piece of space technology in our hands most of the time with our smartphones, but we use space technology um, across different sectors, for example, agriculture and um, healthcare. And we can also use space te technology to, to, um, to help solve societal issues like our journey to net zero and like the issues that we have in Yorkshire with flooding. Within Yorkshire, we have a very space relevant business base. There are over 358 businesses um, identified as relevant to space across the Yorkshire region. 
and 143 of those are already um, involved in space. And those businesses generate 5 billion in UK revenues, um, invest heavily in R&D and are, are very successful at raising capital in terms of grants and private investment. We're also lucky enough to have fantastic academic capability in Yorkshire. So within the whole of Yorkshire, we have 12 universities and 34 regional colleges. And um, those institutions have 50 space relevant research centres, groups and institutions within them, working on a whole range of things from earth ops to advanced manufacturing, from quantum technologies to AI. Um, and Yorkshire Universities is, is an institution that corrals those universities together um, and those universities themselves are very successful in generating businesses and have been res uh, responsible for 16% of spin-offs and 14% of spin-outs in England. The Space Hub Yorkshire it has a vision and that vision is to unlock space for the people and businesses of Yorkshire and Humber, to connect, promote and guide innovation, to raise skills, raise aspiration and to deliver prosperity. And really that is a, a fantastic thing that we know that we can do using space technology. So there is a point in doing this, but really what's the point in terms of the impact of the region? Well, the UK government has said that it wants 10% share of the global space market by 2030. So that is expected to deliver to the UK 30 billion pounds, which could be significant for Yorkshire. It currently sits at 15 billion, so we want to double it. We know that that sector um, exports um, over a third of what it manufactures or delivers. We know that it's high growth. We know that it employs a lot of people. A number of those are apprentices and three out of every four of those has uh, at least a first degree. When we look at the future of space, um, and this is a future of space as designed by the Space Applications Catapult, and when we talk about the future, we're only talking about 2035. We can see that there is um, a, a whole host of things that we expect to happen. And that um, includes space system monitoring greenhouse gases, helping us to drive policy in real time to meet global climate targets, global connectivity, robots in space, servicing satellites and cleaning up orbital debris and manufacturing facilities in space starting to emerge, for example, in semiconductors using the zero gravity environment. But the biggest transformation of all will be how we start to use space technology um, in other sectors, for example, in health, in energy, in finance and in transport. So to summarise space, there are three key components. There's the upstream part, which is about satellites and either launching satellites or getting the data from those satellites and the infrastructure on ground that goes around it. There is a downstream part of that, which is about how we use the data from those satellites. And then there's the third part, which is often forgotten, which is around the skills that's needed for both of those two sectors in upstream and downstream. If we look, therefore, at the space skills, um, industry tells us that they're hard to recruit. And the graph on the right shows us the UK Space Skills Survey in 2020. The things that are being said is that courses in higher education and further education lag behind industry development. We're told that there's a lack of conversion courses, adding a space dimension um, for businesses, that there's a lack of resources in SMEs to supply internal training to help develop those skills. There's an absence of entry routes um, for new recruits from either school or university or college, and that there's stimulation of that pipeline of talent that's needed. If we then look at space technology, um, we need to look at how we can um, innovate across sectors. And no matter what the thesaurus says, there is no substitute for innovation. So how we increase adoption of innovation um, and space technology across, um, across sectors is critical and how we speed that diffusion of innovation up is really important. So if you look at the bell curve here, you can see that while 16% fall into the early adopters or innovators category, there's a whole host within um, a sector that um, take a little bit longer. So how we start to speed up that adoption of innovation will start to increase the amount of skills that we need. And it has to be said that the pandemic has really started to increase the adoption of digital across a whole host of sectors. And you can see that by the conference that we're having today. 
If you look at this quote here um, from John Whittingdale, who was the Minister of State for Media and Data, um, it's interesting to note that data is now the driving force of world economies. It fuels innovation in businesses, both large and small, and it has been a lifeline during the pandemic. But because of that, the demand for data skills is rising and almost half of businesses have struggled to recruit for roles that require data skills. If we look at those data skills, we need to look at three key areas. We need to look at the workforce developments of the existing work workforce. We need to look at the students coming through HE and FE, and we need to look at how we increase that pipeline of talent coming through into colleges and into businesses. When we look at workforce development, we can see that it's falling and it has been through 2013 to 2019. So um, in what we see there is the number of employers providing any training over the pr previous 12 months in blue and the proportion of staff trained over the last 12 months in grey. And you can see that in all areas it's, it's fallen to 2019 and that graph to 2020 is expected to fall again. If we look at um, graduates, Within Yorkshire, we have 10% of all undergraduates. Um, in fact, West Yorkshire has a positive net influence of students, but only 50% of those um, students stay in Yorkshire and Humber after graduating, and only 22% stay in West Yorkshire itself. So the retention of graduates is low. And one thing that we might want to look at is um, an, in an initiative in Sheffield with um, Sheffield Hallam and the University of Sheffield and a programme called RISE, where they are starting to place their graduates into SMEs. Now, what that does not only um, solves a problem in terms of retention of graduates, but it also starts to drive up the adoption of innovation as we start to increase the number of digital natives and skilled digital natives that are, that are within our our SME community. If we look at our apprentices, that's also continued to fall away. And there are lots of reasons potentially for that. But as the number of apprenticeships fall away, so does the influx of talent and skilled talent into our businesses. And so we, we also need to look therefore at how we stimulate that pipeline as well as stimulate those apprentices. Most employers believe relevant work experience is an important factor in recruitment decisions. But it's interesting to note that only 36% of lead city region employers offer work experience and only 11% of employers offer work inspiration activity. Um, and that's from the um, Combined Authority Labour Market Report from this year. So does Sp Space of Yorkshire have a role? And if so, what can it do to help? Well, we know that we can help start to fill the gaps on some of these areas. So some of the things we intend to do is, first of all, to um, to create a virtual space campus. So working with Yorkshire universities, we intend to, um, to create an orbit of innovation around our space, our, our Yorkshire universities to channel innovation in and out, but also to start to provide a better focus for skills within our region. One of the things that will help us to do that is a space prospectus. So, so that space prospectus will start to map out what opportunities there are within the whole of Yorkshire for students to engage with space and space technology. To back that up, we're creating a programme of summer internships and we have started that this summer by providing 14 internships um, for, for West Yorkshire. We had 340 applicants for those places so we know that we are creating um, something that is wanted and those internships look at research projects for businesses um, that are done within summer school at universities so providing real solutions to businesses in our region and real experience to students within our region we intend to link space companies better to further education and to support T levels and apprenticeships within the region. Um, we have a business sprint programme that we're hoping to um, get funding for that will look at how we start to drive up skills um, within our startups and scale ups. We have an events programme that will be um, published later this year, which will start to connect businesses and people to events that talk about adoption of innovation, space technology and skills. And we are starting an inspirational outreach programme, which we've already started with the British Library to look at how we drive up that inspiration to our schools and our students within West Yorkshire. And ultimately, we're hoping to um, gain funding for a Yorkshire Space and Satellite Centre 
in um, Keithley. And that will look at outreach to all the schools in our region and um, it will create a life-size replica of the International Space Station within it and it will um, start to work with schools and provide um, an exciting place for them to start to um, talk about space-based technology and start to inspire their students. I think really to sum it up that in the 21st century, the um, new space race isn't about reaching the moon, but it's a challenge to see who can best capitalise on the social and economic advantages that can flow from space science and technology. And to ca capitalise on those advantages, we really need the right skills. We really need the right skills in both the upstream and downstream areas. So in manufacturing and in data and in digital. And hopefully that's something we can start to think about today. Thank you. So welcome back for the last time, colleagues. Um, and for our last discussion, we'll be talking to Mandy Widyard, uh, or, who I want to thank for putting together that presentation. Um, sadly, Professor Mandy Olson couldn't be with us, um, but I'm sure we can follow up any questions that you might have on email. So, Mandy, we, we've got to know each other quite well over the last year. I've spent a lot of time with you, but I'm not sure we've ever met in person. It's always been online, isn't it? I know. I, I think you're right. And to be fair, um, all the work that we've done on Space of Yorkshire, I've never met any of the team. It's all been done online. And I guess within that, it shows you the power of, um, of digital and, and space technology, that we can still do all these fantastic things and yet um, not actually um, have to go face to face, although it would be nice. Absolutely, of course it would. So um, uh, the first question for you off the back of your presentation is uh, are, are all the employment opportunities about higher level jobs or are there lower level entry points for citizens in West Yorkshire? Um, that's a really interesting question, Nav. If you look at the latest skills survey, it shows that in traditional space companies, three out of every four employees have at least a first degree. Um, but those are the traditional space companies, the sort of satellite manufacturers and, and the, 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 the companies that you'd expect to be known for space. Um, however, space, as it says in the presentation, is going to be um, an enabling technology. And, um, and so therefore it will be, will be throughout everything that we do. And so having more young people involved in space um, companies or enabling space technology is really important and bringing people in through every level, through T levels, through apprenticeships, um, through internships, ev everything is really important to making sure we maximise the opportunity for space. Brilliant. So, uh, well, I mean, connected to that, I suppose, you, you mentioned all sectors, space was going to have some kind of effect on all sectors. Um, is, is that really true? If, if I was working in the health and social care sector, I mean, how how's all this space work going to affect me? Well, there's there's loads of there's loads of um, things I could tell you about, but interestingly, space can help us look at wellness rather than illness as one solution. Um, so there are um, places on the southeast where we use earth obs to monitor um, the bins of vulnerable people to make sure they're being put out on time. And if they're not, then it triggers a response. Um, we can use um, wellness apps where people self-check things at home that is tracked regularly and then that allows the um, medical people to intervene when when's needing. But also there's some really interesting things around making um, pharmaceuticals in space. Um, so there's a whole host of things that oh, you know, God, just I'm not around, really get away with that, just, but hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Pharmaceuticals yeah. in space, what's that about? Well, in the zero um, gravity environment or near zero gravity environments allows, and don't ask me the details, I'm not the the, the really clever person, it's above my pay grade, but um, allows um, things to be manufactured in space in a different way that gives them advantages. And the obvious things to start with are pharmaceuticals and semiconductors. So there are opportunities to manufacturing in space. And I think it said in my presentation that by we're expecting that to happen um, before 2030. So not that you know not not that futuristic really well amazing so Richard Ransom when he goes up are we knocking up some aspirin on the side I don't think there'll be a drive-through boots there just yet <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing because I mean I started entering into conversations I'm having and under let's talk real skills um there's a college we're working with the rail industry and they were talking how they were using satellites to monitor uh, rail the actual yeah. railways themselves and they could judge when any had moved a millimetre and therefore knew that some maintenance was required on that railway track. 
absolutely and they use it to monitor bankings as well um uh, water companies are using it to uh, monitor the um, reservoir levels so that we don't have the issues that were happened in sheffield with the um the, the dam breaking there so it, it it can do everything i mean for flooding it's it can be used really well to um predict what's going to happen and to try and take action to prevent that from happening so earth obs and the data that comes from space is is a, a real opportunity for, to, for us to change a lot of the things that we do mm -hmm. right um, right so so i mean uh, all those opportunities are there um but what, what about for west yorkshire i mean are, are we in competition with other areas across the country or indeed the other regions across the world is there a sense of competition about getting hold of those jobs and trying to attract them to West Yorkshire? I think um, one thing that's really interesting with the work that we've done within Space Hub Yorkshire is we've looked at foreign direct investments into um, the UK by space companies um, and obviously that's a really good way of, of producing employment really quickly and then creating a need for skills and what we found interesting was that every single region in the UK has had a, um, a space foreign direct investment apart from Yorkshire and so um, one of the things on the agenda is to make sure that we shout loudly enough um, to um, let people know that uh, space is is a place to come to. Uh, sorry, Yorkshire is a place to come to for space. We have over 350 companies here already working in that region. We have the best universities, the higher, highest number of um, higher education institutes outside of London in our 12 Yorkshire universities, plus 34 regional colleges, national institutions um, here and lots of research and innovation that all supports that, um, that investment. So, you know, watch this space. That's something that we're really working hard on. Right. And, and, and so um, 350 companies, that, that sounds a lot. I mean, could you give us a, a sketch maybe of a few of them? Um, you've got companies um, like if you look at some of the um, JBA Consulting who are um, doing lots of earth observation type stuff. You've got um, lots of our precision manufacturers who are making components or um, control panels, different things for either rockets or satellites. Um, you've got companies like Yorkshire Water using space technology. So lots and lots of different types of companies are using space. Within Leeds University, we have a company called Sense, which is providing doctorates for, for the world in um, Earth observation, for example. So l lots of companies already working in this area. Well, it's impressive and um, a little bit daunting as well. But um, one simple question, I know you've got the answer to this. Um, how can space technology be used to inspire people into studying STEM subjects? I think studying STEM sub subjects and even, you know, STEAM subjects, putting art in there as well, is, is really important to the future of anything to do with engineering, science and space technology. Um, and uh, it's something that I think we need to do more of. Um, creating that pipeline of talents is something that will help us make sure that we have the skills available and the people available to take advantage of, of um, the jobs that are created through both science and space and through the, the green agenda. Um, so something that we're doing at Space Hub Yorkshire is working really hard with um, the outreach into schools. So we're already doing some work with the, York, uh, with the British Library on this. Um, and there is a bid at the moment in for Keithley to start a space and satellite centre for the schools in Yorkshire to um, create a, a replica of the International Space Station inside it and be used for, for that very purpose. So lots of stuff we need to do. Space is really sexy and it really captures the imagination of young people. Um, so it's a great great way to get kids interested in, in STEM subjects. Great, thank you. So uh, a little bit more of a specific question now. Um, advanced materials is massively important in space technology. Mm. Um, building on the moon or even Mars needs new materials approaches. Um, are we providing high quality material scientists with space relevant knowledge in West Yorkshire? I, I can't answer for West Yorkshire, but I can answer for Yorkshire because that's the um, the landscape that I've looked at. So one of the things we looked at was our um, our 12 
universities and we're trying to set up a, a virtual space campus across those universities to take advantage of um, the connections between them and between those universities we have every different function that you would need for a space agency from quantum physics through to earth observations from material science um, through through to the physics behind it all so we're confident that within our universities in Yorkshire we are producing everything that we need what we need to make sure we do though in Yorkshire is we um, maintain our graduates so only 22 percent of graduates in in um, West Yorkshire stay in West Yorkshire Yorkshire itself has 10 percent of the undergraduate population so a huge number of undergraduates so I think as a region we have to work harder in, in holding on to that talent that we've trained Great, and, and I think following on, um, I think someone with a particular interest in material science, um, uh, there are well documented shortages of graduate material scientists. Well, I, I didn't know. Um, is this an issue um, uh, in space technology in West Yorkshire? Um, and should we be putting space relevant modules into our apprenticeships or indeed our degree programmes? Well, the interesting thing is that if you want to work in space there is no faculty of space in our universities mm. so one of the things that we're doing at space of yorkshire is trying to put together a, um, a prospectus for all of the universities to start to really flag up the opportunities i mean as, as a student you need to go and study in geography or maths or physics or computer science but there's no direct link and we also need to show the pathways from those courses like material science for example into the relevant companies so um, we've just started an internship program um, that we've put together quite quickly this summer um, and we started with 14 places that combine businesses and universities so solving real life business problems within university research facilities for undergraduates or students um, over the summer so like a summer school um, for those 14 places we had nearly 300 applications and we didn't wow. really advertise it so we know that there's a need to do that and I completely take your point that um, the more talent that we can get through the relevant courses um, the, the better off we'll be. Material science is one thing, RF engineering is another issue. And so um, RF engineering is something that we know businesses in our region are saying they're finding difficult to um, to find. So, so we have a big history of SATCOMs in, in West Yorkshire and we don't have the engineers to fulfill the needs in in, in that area. Uh, so we know uh, we need sorry, to connect those, sorry, dots, those dots. Yeah. Uh, for the benefit of our audience, RF it's it's, it's how you make make your mobile phones and satellite technology work so it's it's to do with the semiconductors but i'm not an expert um nav in everything i'm a, I'm a chemist and an aerospace engineer so so i have an understanding but if you want some, a technical answer i'll have to email you later when i've spoken to somebody brilliant <laughs> well to be honest i can't believe you're not an expert in everything <laughs> you've always got enough to say randy um <laughs> And it is great to see that Yorkshire Space and Satellite Centre um, hopefully starting off in Keithley. We were hoping to get it in Shipley, but say la vie, there's, there's the rub. Um, do you think when, when you develop that, there's going to be some serious consideration of um, how to appeal to young people um, rather than, uh, as it says here, tokenistic approaches to encourage girls? Do you think you're going to be able to start anything deeper that's going to attract young people into the industry? Uh, I I really hope so because um, space is. If you look at the, um, the the team behind Space Hub Yorkshire, it was um, there's three people who really started it going, and two of us are female. And I have a particular um, thing about women in engineering and women in science. But it's not just women; it's it's every community that we need to attract. And inclusivity is within our strategy, so it's something we'll be working hard at. No, and. Uh, the, there's a question here about um, is there a possibility of creating some STEM ambassadors perhaps with a space focus that could work in school? I think that's a great idea and that's something that, um, that I'll take on board and see whether we can look at that um, and develop something specific. So tell us, when are you hoping to open the Space Centre? Well, it's not it's not me doing it. It's um, it's a chap called Tim Rogers who's put a, a, a great um, a great pitch together to do it. Um, we're supporting it, um, and I, I really hope we we get to do that sometime later this year, but certainly next year. So, um, in between leading on the Space Hub work, um, you're also a member of the Bradford Sustainable Partnership. 
you were telling me earlier, which I, I didn't actually realise. So that means you are qualified, you are an expert to answer my next question, which was uh, directed at Professor Colson. Um, but what carbon cuts, i.e. specific changes, can each business and household initiate to contribute to carbon capture or carbon saving? Uh, I think there's there's lots that we need to think about. Obviously, the change to um, the way we travel is important. Um, I think for SMEs, it's about looking at what we do. So having the opportunity to start to um, start to audit our processes and see where we can make savings. I mean, you know, after all, we're all in Yorkshire and in Yorkshire, we like a good deal and we like to save money <laughs> and reducing carbon in lots of cases is about saving money. So it, it should be a natural thing that we want to do for the right reason, but also for a financial reason. I think the two things um, work together and that's something that certainly in my company we're looking at very, very seriously and have a, a big, a big pathway going on at the moment. I'm surprised you've got any time at work with your company and all the other stuff you're involved with. But say, say I am a local business and, and I want to get on and do that audit. Um, where do I start? Do I just ask Mr. Google? Um, I think that's a good start. I think um, talking to the LEP or to Brevard Council and there may be some help there, but there are lots of places you can get help. I, I haven't prepared for this because I wasn't expecting it, but um, but if you go to your LEP or your council, I'm sure they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Yeah, I'm sorry, but if your fellow speaker doesn't turn up, then you get lumbered with it. I apologise. <laughs> so I mean, what do you think you've done at your company to address the green agenda? Well, we've um, certainly improved all of our machinery. So we have the latest technology that is the most efficient technology that we have. We're in a new um, factory, so we've designed it around um, using the least electricity that we can. So we have lights that turn themselves off. We have water sprinklers to save water because it's not just green, it's green and blue that are important. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're not the best example. We're not, we're not there yet, but we're certainly doing our best to um, make all the improvements that we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it is a, a tricky number that needs everyone involved. I know at the college we did a carbon management plan um, several years ago. Um, and it, it does need uh, everyone to get involved, doesn't it, from senior management down to shop floor, if you're really going to make a, a difference. It, it absolutely does. And I, I think it's it's really important to look at everything from cradle to grave. Mm -hmm. How you get yeah. to work. So we have a bike to work scheme, for example. You know, everything like that is important. Absolutely. So um, you did ask me to mention one thing. Um, you're also part of the uh, Lead City Region Digital Partnership. Um, and yeah. you've got a festival that's coming up. So tell us more. Yeah. So the Leeds Digital Festival um, is really important. It's an open platform. Um, so you can get involved with your companies or with your projects. Um, although you will need to submit between, before the 18th of August. If you look online, you'll find it. But it involves everything from coding, fintech, social media, AI, digital marketing. So it's, it's, it's for everyone, really. Um, and it's from September the 20th to the 1st of October. So whether you want to participate as um, a viewer or as somebody providing providing information, I think it's definitely something worth looking into. So what's actually going to happen? I mean, we all like the idea of a festival, but what's going on? I don't, I don't think we'll be there with our um, with our neon lights, um, Nav, and, um, and and drinking beers. But uh, but I think it will be a, a series of events, a little bit like today, but over a two week period. Right, and I'm glad to hear there won't be neon lights because uh, we all want to save on carbon. Uh, <laughs> Mandy, you, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for covering Speaking for Two. It, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, and thank you for doing the original presentation as well. That was great, Nav. And thank you for letting me get a word in you don't normally. Yeah, oh, you cheating. <laughs> <Who'd have thought? laughs> so um, uh, thank you very much, everybody. I, I hope you've enjoyed the day. Um, we've enjoyed putting it together. Um, we are uh, newly branded as the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership um, and next year's conference will be the West Yorkshire Skills Partnership Conference rather than the Leeds City Region. Um, it's always great coming together with colleagues um, and perhaps hearing about the work that's going up across uh, the sector. If you or your organisation has got something that you want to uh, advertise wider um, across the skills, um, sector, please do remember that this uh, will happen at a similar time next year um, and, and you might want to think about what you want to share with colleagues. 
Um, I've taken two main things away. Um, well, there were thoughts that were developing in my head anyway in advance of the con conference, but um, it's essentially about how do we make our point to local government? And I think we've all got a range of um, participants that we want to support with particular sets of needs, um, as well as just the general populace, I suppose. Um, but I think we need to find a way of phasing that and putting our case to policymakers. Um, and I think crucial because of the um, uh, uh, the difficult situation exacerbated by the pandemic is how do we support those most distant from the labour market um, into sustained, uh, good and inclusive uh, employment. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers, much appreciated, and also thank the team that were behind this um, uh, Present, uh, set of first presentations. I think the ball has gone fairly smoothly. I haven't heard people panicking too much online. Um, so take care, go out there and educate someone. I'll see you in a year's time. Bye-bye.